So today we'll be talking about uh, pre-registrations and register reports. Uh, this is part of a uh, um, greater uh, presentation that I usually give as part of courses here at HKU, Hong Kong University. And uh, in my courses, I try best I can to work together with students to conduct what we refer to as open science. Um, our, it's a movement, it's, a, it's a sort of an initiative to try and open up science and improve the way that we do uh, psychological science and science overall. And it's part of something that's called a credibility revolution, which I'll touch on very, very briefly, uh, just to kind of like give you a sense where uh, this is coming from. Um, you can scan uh, this to see the cloud folder. You can uh, download the presentation and follow. Uh, while I'm talking, if you didn't have a chance to download the links, it's going to appear on the right-hand side uh, on the bottom. Uh, during any of the talk, any time that you have any questions and you want to ask something, I'll try to follow the chat and, and answer your questions. So uh, just, just feel free at any time uh, and then I'll, I'll try and fit this in. Uh, just to invite you to another one, another workshop that I'll be giving exactly the same time, so 1 to 4 p.m. That's going to happen uh, next week about uh, new, relatively new tools that we have that are completely open source uh, to promote open science, uh, a new way for us to do statistics. So you might be familiar with R because R is sort of like a programming language that we've been using in order to uh, try and push forward uh, statistics. Uh, but then in the last two years, we've had two new projects, uh, Jamovi and JASP. Uh, JASP is a little bit more oriented towards the Bayesian, but they have similar functionality. Jamovi now also has Bayesian. So both of these tools are open uh, source built on R, but they look like what you might uh, be familiar with from SPSS. So if you want to know a little bit more about that, uh, then this is going to be uh, more in depth uh, next week. But already today, I'll show you a little bit of something regarding Jamovi because I want to show you a little bit of the process of how we do pre-registrations. So we'll be doing things uh, live. So rather than me just babbling around for about a half an hour to an hour and only then uh, showing you uh, what happens, I think I'm just gonna uh, do a pre-registration together with you uh, at the beginning, at the onset, and then uh, hopefully uh, that will give you sort of an idea later to put everything uh, in context. Um, so it's going to be a live demonstration. Uh, could be that things are not going to work out as expected, but before I, I show you uh, this, I should point out that in the cloud folder, uh, so you can see under the um, the main folder, so you have this, uh, if you went to the cloud folder and you downloaded this, then you'll have the uh, presentations. And under the presentation, there's the one that I gave uh, last year, and this is the one that we're doing right now. And under this, uh, there's already an example that I'll be go going over later. You have the presentation itself that you can uh, download. But then there's also our pre-reg example. So as you can see earlier today, uh, you can see the timing over here. I decided that I'm going to do a hands-on thing. So I just decided to do a research project. Uh, for us today, uh, based on our very little sample, I decided uh, we're going to register uh, some hypotheses. So what you can see over here is that we have uh, all sorts of uh, things. So for example, if we uh, open uh, this over here, then you can see that this is a, a Qualtrics file. So Qualtrics is a surveying uh, um, software that we have. Uh, so it's like a document and it goes over all the materials and things that you'll be uh, answering later on. Uh, then there's a Qualtrics uh, imported file. There's a pre-registration file. So I'll go over with this uh, later together uh, with you. And so we, if we open this, you can see that uh, I'm going, uh, you know, has all the details. It looks, uh, looks a little bit like a manuscript. So we'll be going over uh, then. So there's abstract and all this about what this, what this actually uh, means. What you can also see is that there's an SPSS file or SPSS format file called uh, .sav uh, plus some Jamovi files that you might not be familiar with and OMV and OMT. So today 
I wrote a pre-registration. It took me about half an hour. I simulated some data on a Qualtrics. So I designed the survey, simulated some data, <clears throat> and then, uh, so this is, it's over here. Uh, so this awaits uh, your, your results, uh, which we'll do later on. But now that I have this, uh, this directory, so I have everything that I need. I have the pre-registration file, I have the Qualtrics export. I have some simulated data, and then I have a data analysis plan, which I ran with uh, Jamovi. I'll show you all this later on, but assume right now that this is a good pre-registration and that you are familiar with everything, and this is ready for a pre-registration. A pre-registration is before we collect the data. So this Qualtrics right now over here is waiting data which we will enter later by you answering some questions. But right now, this is completely empty. So before we collect the data, we make a very, very detailed plan about you know, all the call tricks and everything that we're going to run in terms of the data analysis and the design, everything. And now it's time for us to go and uh, pre-register. So what I do is that I go on the Open Science Framework. As you can see, it opens, uh, supposed to open my account. I'll sign in. So you can sign with uh, uh, your ORCID uh, or your institution. Uh, I, because I travel between institutions, I use my Gmail. So that's it, but you can register multiple, uh, multiple um, uh, emails. And then as you can see, there are lots of projects. Um, actually, if you go to my main page, you'll see that there's uh, all, all sorts of, there's really uh, a lot that's going on uh, in, in my profile. And what you can see here is that you have the title of the projects, you have the con uh, contributors. So some of this uh, I did. So for example, everything that has to do with my courses. So the two courses that I teach, all the materials I upload to the Open Science Framework. Uh, but you can also see some of the projects that I have with uh, some students that are working with me and then uh, some other um, people about all sorts of things. And everything that we do, uh, involves Open Science Framework for two things. Uh, one of them is that we share everything that we have. So it means that this allows you to upload everything that you would want. So let's say that, for example, uh, we want to look at these two. Um, let me just hide this. <clears throat> so let's say, for example, we want to look at uh, the, these courses. So for example, in these courses, you can see all the lectures. You can go here and you can uh, look at all the materials. So it's a good it's a good place to uh, upload the data, um, everything uh, that has to do with a project or even with a course. Uh, so that's nice. But also in terms of uh, all sorts of projects, research projects, you can see that if we go into uh, one of these, so let's say, for example, which one has been completed. So let's say this one has been completed already and published. Uh, so if we go into this, you'll see that it includes uh, so all the collaborators and it has uh, all the data and all the code um, and a preprint if you want to have a look at this. What you can see is that aside from the regular stuff over here, there's also this thing over here on the bottom. And this thing over here on the bottom is a pre-registration. So it has a component. And this component says that this has been registered somewhere in 2019. And what you can do is that you can actually uh, go and have a look at this uh, pre-registration. Pre um, yeah. So this is what a pre-registration looks like for this specific replication and extension that we conducted. Um, this is what uh, it shows. So it shows uh, who I am, who I did this with. So one of my guided thesis uh, students. And then what it says over here in the summary, it could have a lot more, but I chose a specific type of registration called an open-ended registration. And what it says in the summary is, um, you know, we did all sorts of things and then ask you to please go on the uh, files and then have a look at the file. So what it actually did is that there is a, a directory called pre-registration where we uploaded one is a, a pre-registration plan and the second thing is all the materials that we wanted to do in terms of um, the Qualtrics files. So if, for example, I click on this, then uh, I can go in and, and have a look at this. Now, what you can see uh, over here is that it says this file is part of a registration and it's been shown in its archived version. So this cannot be altered. So it means that even if afterwards, you know, I gave up on this project or I failed to, uh, you know, uh, publish this in some way, 
uh, then everything is still there. It's always going to be on the Open Science Framework uh, available uh, for anybody to see. So once you pre-registered something, it means that you put this in an open, publicly accessible repository like the Open Science Framework, and then you can embargo this, let's say for four years, you just want to see this with yourself and perhaps your collaborator. But then at some point, uh, this becomes public. I make all my pre-registrations immediately public. I like to get feedback. I want to others to know what it is that I'm doing. But if you're a little bit concerned about getting scooped or whatever it is that your concern is, uh, then you can actually embargo this. You can make sure that only you can access this, but you need to put a date on what time this is going to become uh, publicly accessible. So once you pre-register, it takes a mirror, it takes a copy, a duplicate of everything that you have in your directory. So in this case, I only had a pre-registration directory and these three files, which have the, you know, all the hypothesis and all the pre-registration. And then it had uh, the Qualtrics and, and it I made a copy of this and it made that copy uh, publicly uh, available. And then finally, when we submitted this to uh, the journal, we uh, gave this uh, link over here that other reviewers can come in and have a look at. So uh, if we go back to uh, this page, what we're going to do over here is that I'm going to go back to uh, my project and I'm going to build a new project uh, with you regarding our uh, workshop. So we can create a project and we'll call this the HQRR uh, Workshop 2020. Uh, and we'll, we'll create this. Uh, I can go to the new project uh, immediately. So you can see over here, I have the contributors. So if I want, I can uh, add different people. Uh, I can also have view only links. So for example, if I uh, want people to see my pre-registration, but I don't want them to know who I am, what I can do over here is I can add view only links where I can anonymize uh, these links. So you can share a pre-registration with your reviewers without them knowing who you are, providing of course that no files have anything that has your name on it. Because I don't really care about anonymizing who I am, I don't care if the reviewers uh, know who, I, who submitted, Actually, I don't really care about this, but you can have a view only link that's either anonymized or not anonymized. Uh, but let's say if this project, if it's private, this is a good way for you to share it with outside world. Now, what you can see over here is that actually it provides you a, a lot of really interesting stuff, which I use, uh, especially for my courses. But let's say you want a wiki. So you want to update some information, you can add this uh, over here. And over here, and I think this is the main component that most people use, is that you have the open science uh, framework storage. Uh, if you don't like to store things in the United States, like some Europeans uh, have some uh, concerns about this, then you can actually choose a repository in, in Australia, I think, and in Europe in some places. So you can control this sort of thing, but it does indicate where this uh, storage is at. And the Open Science Framework, I think, has right now the budget and the funding to keep those files for the next 30 years or 50 years, something like that, into the future. So you don't have to worry about, you know, this website shutting down. Everything that you upload here on the Open Science Framework um, is, is going to be uh, kept here. So some people put this, uh, you know, put their files on their institutional uh, website, but I, I just put everything on the Open Science Framework. And I feel like this is becoming the de facto, you know, the default um, standard of our field, especially in, in psychology, social psychology, but also of other fields have started to use, use this on a, on a mass scale. And the thing about this is that this is a regular uh, file um, thing. You can actually drag things into it. So if we go back to uh, this over here, what I can do is I can, uh, if I can just uh, refresh this, so I'll refresh this, I can go here and you can see I can create a folder and I'm gonna call this pre-registration and it will create that folder over here. And what I can just do is that I'm going to uh, drag all the, all the files and I'm going to upload them just by you know, drag and drop. And as you can see, this is uploading uh, right now. So 
um, it will tell me that everything is uploaded successfully. And then if I just like click on some of this, so for example, just looking at my simulated data, if I open this SAV file, you can see that Open Science Framework is actually quite clever because it knows how to read all sorts of things. So it knows how to read an SPSS file and it knows how to open it for you so that it has, like you can see all my uh, randomized uh, data with lots of uh, ones, and, ones and zeros. Over here, uh, Colchix also keeps the uh, location. You can decide if you want this or not, or response ID, all sorts of other things. But the, the interesting thing is that you can actually uh, see all of that uh, within the Open Science uh, Framework. Now, for our goal, for the pre-registration goal, uh, once we've added all the contributors and we did everything you know, in terms of setting up, writing the analysis, you can also like do a license if you want the Creative Commons or whatever other uh, open source uh, license you're using. Uh, once you've once you've finished all of this, uh, you have all sorts of tabs that you can you know, some interesting add-ons over there if you want to connect to GitHub, whatever it is uh, that, that you're using in order to develop your code. But the the one thing I wanted to show you for the pre-registration is this registration uh, tab. What you can see over here is right, right now there are no completed registrations of this uh, project, but we're going to uh, open one. I'm going to open a new registration. And when we open this, you can actually see there's lots of different templates. So depending on what it is that you want to do with your uh, project, what kind of project that is. So for example, if this is a replication, so we do a lot of replications in my courses and I do this with my collaborators and students. So perhaps you would want the replication recipe over here, um, prayer post and so forth. A very common one in social psychology is this one in 2016. So it's based on a paper from JSP. Um, that, that we initially used in the first year, I think, of our project. We used this before we moved on. But there's also a registered report protocol pre-registration. So we'll talk about what is the difference between registered report and what is the, uh, um, you know, from pre-registration, what, uh, what, what differentiates these two. And then there's like a, a template over here for OSF. So I'll just show you one example of what that means. What is an OSF pre-registration? So it opens up. And it asks you a lot of questions. First of all, you add some metadata so you can add, you know, the title and the contributors and you know what kind of project this is uh, and your field. But then very fast it gets to uh, some very specific questions about before you collect the data, please write down your hypothesis. Now the nice thing is that there are uh, all sorts of examples. So it doesn't need to be a very long text. It could be something like if taste affects preferences, then mean preference, uh, you know, will be higher and so forth. And then in terms of design, uh, you, you're asked to say, what kind of design do you have? Is it an experiment, an observation, or perhaps it's a meta-analysis? Um, then you need to indicate all sorts of things in terms of, did you take this into consideration in your uh, design? Did you do blinding? What is your design? And you can see all sorts of examples. So you're, for example, uh, between subject design, how many factors, how many levels, uh, and so forth. So it really takes you uh, step by step. Uh, first, the information, then the design, then there's a sampling plan in terms of uh, wh when are you doing this, to what extent are you doing this, uh, how are you going to collect the, the, the data. So are you recruiting them, you know, participant pool at HKU, is it online somehow, and are you going to the field, what that's about. Then the variables, are you manipulating variables, um, in terms of your IV, what are the dependent me measures, uh, measured uh, variables. Um, and then you can, if you want, you can also include some files. So let's say there are some files already on the OSF, then you can actually go in here and select uh, some of these files and add this to your pre-registration. Finally, after you set all, everything about the designs and your variables and all that, you also need to uh, be very specific about how are you going to analyze things what is the statistical test that you aim to run? So for example, over here, it just says, you know, ANOVA, ANOVA, multiple regression, uh, you know, SCM, all, all, these, all these things, uh, but also um, telling, you know, in terms of all, all things that you'll need to test. So let's say that you're testing for normality and you want to know if you need to uh, center things in sort of recording uh, things in order to get your analysis done. So what are you planning to do? before you actually see the data. 
Uh, very important are things regarding data exclusion. So, uh, you know, reducing the flexibility of what kind of exclusion you're going to do in the future, missing data, uh, how are you going to deal with this, and uh, perhaps some exploratory analysis. Exploratory just means that you're not really sure what your hypothesis is, but it's something that's really interesting to you. So, for example, let's say demographics. So, some people are always interested to know, you know, is there a difference between males and females? Is there a difference for social status, uh, rich and poor, where people are from? But they don't have a clear hypothesis. They don't say like uh, females are more than males and, and all that. So they just say, exploratory analysis, I'm going to also analyze uh, gender uh, in there. Um, anything else that you might want to add in terms of all that? And once you've, you've finished all of this, you can do a review. So it will give you like a summary uh, of all of that. And then once things are completed, then it will really uh, check that you've completed everything that was supposed to be in there. Only there can you actually uh, go back uh, you know, to, to this uh, green button over here and press uh, register. So. Uh, right now, I'm not going to bother you with like going through my hypothesis. I also don't want you to know what my hypothesis is because you're my participant pool. But what I am going to do is that I'm going to use what I already wrote. So what I already wrote is in the pre-registration folder. So for that, what I have is the open-ended uh, uh, pre-registration. And what that does is it just, it takes a copy of the pre-registration um, directory and then it timestamps uh, that. So all I need to do is go over here and it says uh, all pre-reg uh, documents are in the uh, pre-registration folder, uh, plus uh, simulated data, plus uh, data analysis plan uh, using Jamovi. Um, so that's about it. So that's all is required. So once I already wrote the documents, then there's no real need for me to start copy pasting from uh, what it is that I created to their templates. The templates just make it easier, I think, for aggregation and also for reviewers that are familiar with these templates. But you can also do this with your own uh, Word documents. Um, so I'm just gonna do this together with you. So there's a, a license. So typically, I don't know, I use that. What do, what do I usually use? All sorts of licenses over here. So I use this one, CC BY. And then I just uh, flag this over here, and then I'm just gonna do. Uh, so this is in judgment and decision making. So I just tag this in in some way, and then I um, move forward. Provide the narrative summary. What is contained? I'm just gonna paste this again because everything is in that folder. And then I need to review this. And you can see that it includes everything that I uh, just tagged in terms of the license and so forth. And now I do uh, register. So when I press register, you'll see it gives me a choice. Do you want to make this registration public immediately? Or do you want to enter this into a, an embargo? Embargo means that only you can see this, but you already, if I choose embargo, you need to tell it at what time can I, um, can the system make it public? So let's say uh, you're doing, let's say 2030. Um, then you can't. Uh, and the point I was, I thought it's gonna blank it up, uh, but it get, gets you only uh, four years. So the maximum that you can hold this private is only four years. So you can see the latest that I can choose over here is the 20th uh, of, of September in uh, 2024. But for me, I like getting some, uh, you, know, you know, feedback. I want people to know what it is that I'm doing so I can make it public immediately. And also a good feature, if I'm afraid of other people taking my ideas, actually for me to put this publicly means that I, um, I'm associated with this. I have a DOI, other people can cite me and whoever, try to you know use this and publish this uh, perhaps later i can come back and say look at this time stuff look at this doi i'm the person that that did this first so actually there's something about a pre-registration uh, being public you know on this kind of website especially if it has a doi that really uh, allows you to get credit for what it is that that you've done in this pre-registration so it's enough that you have an idea it's enough that you've designed something you have a, a 
you know, a full pre-registration, even before you collected the data, this is a good way for you to um, make sure that your ideas are out there in public and are associated uh, with you. So we'll go ahead and do this. Uh, we'll submit this. Um, yeah, so what you'll see over here is that this registration is cur currently archiving and it takes a while for it to come to come in. I'm not going to show you um, what it looks like, but it sends you an email. And on the email, it says uh, registration pending for one of your projects. What do you want to do? And then it says to approve this um, registration, click the following link. So it's not yet registered. It just archived this. And then they send you the, the email um, to, to your account. And then they ask you to approve. I'm going to go ahead and click this on my mobile. Um, to, to approve our pre-registration. So I approve this and now if I refresh this page, you'll see that it is registered. Yeah, so you can see exactly when this was registered and just like before, you know, everything that we uh, approve. And then once, uh, so I can't touch this anymore. So this is now, you know, on the OSF, uh, cannot be changed in any way. Anybody can access this. So you can uh, try try and access this yourself based on this link. And if I go into the files, you will see all of all of the uh, files that I uploaded to the pre-registration. And that's it. It's there forever. I pre-registered uh, my plan of what it is that we're going to do uh, over here. Very, very simple. Uh, most of the pre-registrations that we do, we do this way because in my project, uh, the students write uh, manuscripts. They um, they do the, the Qualtrics, um, they do the simulated data sets, and then they hand this to me and I do the pre-registration. And I do a lot of these in a very short period of time. So rather than me putting everything into the templates, I just upload the files and I do an open-ended uh, pre-registration. Pre so hopefully that uh, helped show you how simple it is to do a pre-registration. It's simple, at least in the technical aspect of once you have all your pre-registration files and you have your simulated data and you have a data analysis uh, plan, then just uploading this to the OSF is very, very easy. Uh, and then doing the pre-registration, you saw I got an immediate email, I approved it, and now I can see uh, everything uh, in, front, in front of you. Now, if you have any questions about this or there's something that's not clear about what it is that I, I've done, uh, then let, let me know. Now, this thing over here, you can already you know, um, uh, share this with other people. You can also have uh, some statistics about who accessed this, to what extent, what hour of the day. So there's some interesting stuff that you can do here on OSF that it gives you all sorts of, all sorts of things. But finally, um, I, on, on this project, so if we go back to uh, the main, so it says which project that this was registered from. So you can go to back to the... <clears throat> to the main workshop. Now, even this, I'm going to make uh, public. Um, so to review your projects, I confirm. So now this is public and anybody can access this. Let's say that I want to make the pre-registration also available. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to link uh, the project. I can search through uh, registration. So for example, I, you can see that my uh, pre-registration is already uh, it already appears over here. And what I can do is that I can add my pre-registration. I can press done. And then you can see that it will appear here as a component. So under this project, which is our workshop, there is this component over here that says HQRR workshop. And then not only did it add it over here so that you can go and follow this link over here, but also it, it as you can see, it puts it under so this can change. Now I can upload something new. I can delete some, some files. I can play around with this, but this component over here, which is my pre-registration, this I cannot touch because this is an archive uh, and part of a pre-registration. So pre-registration is forever. It's going to stay there uh, until, until the end of time or the end of uh, uh, the open science uh, framework. So hopefully that was uh, clear enough since I don't see any questions on the chat. I'm assuming that this was clear. Now, so uh, so we dove we dove right in. So that means that uh, now that we pre-registered, now we can do a data collection. So I can't. Let me see how many people are here. Okay, so we have like 40 
40 people, so that's gonna be interesting. And I want to, I, I did something very uh, quick today. It took me about half an hour to design and design this uh, thing just so I can demonstrate to you. So what I'm asking you to do right now is either scan this or follow this uh, link over here. So MGTO our workshop survey. And it's just two questions. It should take you less than a minute, uh, but I just want to ask you about, you know, a, a scenario, let's say that you join a university and there's, there's a decision to be made. So what's your, what's your decision uh, about this? I'm gonna give you uh, like a, a minute to go in, follow this, uh, read this, uh, answer these two questions. Um, if, if you can, if it's not too much hassle, if you can write to me on the chat that you've done this, that you've completed this, and then that will give me sort of an indication of, of where we are with how many people. And then I'm going to show you uh, what I'm going to do with the data collection uh, with the pre-registration uh, material. So go ahead and follow the link. Hopefully that, that works. Uh, if I go into the data analysis in terms of the, the Qualtrics, I can have a look and see how many people are here. So there's 18 in process, uh, four, four in process, there are about 18 uh, overall, so maybe 11 uh, here. What you can see is that I have um, so I have all your uh, uh, responses. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, things in here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you that in terms of my uh, pre-registration, all right, so um, what do I wanna show you? Completed, terrific, okay. So I think most of you have, have done this. Now, what I want to show you is that um, I simulated some data. So if I just open this, like on SPSS, which I'm not gonna do because SPSS takes a long time to load, but I'm going to load this uh, with Jamovi. Uh, so I wanna show you what my simulated uh, data uh, looked like and why, why this is considered a data analysis uh, plan. So when I tried to do this workshop before and show Jamovi, uh, Zoom uh, gave me some trouble because my system wasn't uh, ready for the load. But what you can see here is that this looks very much like, um, SP if you can, if there's some delay or something is not working well with the Zoom, then please let me know. But hopefully once the Jamovi is loaded, then we're going to be okay also with the Zoom. So what you can see over here, it really looks like SPSS if you're not familiar with Jamovi. So we'll be going over this in uh, next week's uh, workshop. Now, what you can see is that we have this uh, data, all this is simulated data, so that's not your data. So you can see that we have these uh, three conditions about, uh, so, you know, you had two questions about pre-registration and about sharing. And I did three different conditions uh, that I'll show you what these conditions uh, were. And then I, um, from that, I computed some variables and then I computed what the condition uh, was. Now, what makes this a data analysis is that you can see over here that I already conducted some analysis. So for example, I did a proportions test or a, a, chi, a chi-square contingency table cross tabs. So for example, I wanted to know whether the pre-registration is dependent on the condition. So did things change or not? The thing about simulated data is simulated data is random. So it's not supposed to show any uh, meaningful effects. So that would make sense that the p-value is not even close to 0 0.05. And then you can see that it's pretty equal uh, in terms of zeros and one for each one of the, of the conditions, the yes, the, the neutral or, or the no. Um, so I did this, once I did this analysis, this uh, cross-tab contingency table um, on the pre-registration question that you just saw. And then I, I did this once on the sharing question uh, that you just saw. Then I added some descriptives and you can see that I, I kind of I had this uh, uh, nice graphs that Jamovi uh, creates almost automatically. So what you can see is generally we have a yes, a neutral, and no con um, conditions, and then there's a, a yes or no. So yes is that you want to share, no is that you don't want to share, pre-registration is that you want to pre-register, as you already don't want to pre-register. So you can already like get a sense of what the data uh, looks like. Very, very simple data. So this was not a complicated pre-registration. I had an idea, I uh, did this on uh, Qualtrics, and then I was able to generate data. How did I do this? I'm gonna show you what the survey uh, was about. So I want to know about your uh, open science uh, practices. So what I did over here, if you're not familiar with this uh, Qualtrics, is that I had three conditions. 
So um, the thing that I manipulated is the default. So in terms of the default, some of you saw the default as your university. The default is um, to do open science. So it means to share and to do pre registration. And then I already highlighted for you, I already highlighted that uh, the pre registration as the option uh, yes, I already highlighted as, um, as marked. So I'll show you what that looks like. So in the first condition, this was already chosen. So yes was already chosen for you. So this makes that the default, okay? Now if we go back, and we see the second condition. The second condition, the, the default is no open science. And you can see that the options selected is no. So if we look at this uh, block, what you'll see is that it says your university does not share. The default at your university is that it doesn't share all the research. And this is selected by default. And finally, we also need the neutral condition. So in the neutral condition, I didn't say anything about the university. I just gave you an option. You are now embarking on your first research project. Please choose what that is. So there are no defaults. Everything is open. You can actually uh, choose. Why, why this effect? Because it's a very, very simple effect. Uh, one of the classics in judgment and decision making when you, perhaps you've heard of nudging. So if you set the defaults a different way. So if you are in an environment, let's say your university, where the default is to conduct pre-registration and do open science, my hypothesis was that this would lead you to choose uh, that or if you have these two options and one is selected by default, perhaps you know you just say yeah, I'm just going to go with the default. I don't want to to change uh, from that. So we have this tendency to stick to the status quo. We have this tendency not to take action and just like uh, go go with whatever the defaults are. And in judgment and decision making, we see all sorts of implications in the way that people choose uh, to be organ donors, yes or no, to donate, yes or no. Uh, have pensions, you know, all these sort of things. So for us, when we want to nudge people into doing something, we just set the defaults a little bit uh, differently. So I just thought I'm going to write this really quickly and see whether this works or not. So if we go back, what we can do right now is that we can go back to the data analysis. And now that all of you hopefully uh, have finished answering this survey, so we have 25 that's pretty good, I, more than I expected, honestly. And now we can export uh, this. So I'm just going to go ahead and export this to our uh, directory. I'm going to do this in the SPSS mode. I'm going to download all the fields. I'm going to take this over here. Um, so this is a uh, real data. Let's call it real data. Now, the nice thing about Jamovi is that here you can see what happens, uh, you know, when, when you use the simulated data, but Jamovi also has templates. So once you're happy with this sort of, um, with your analysis with the data plan that you have in terms of how to analyze things and what kind of, you know, analysis you want, you want to do, chi-square and what kind of plots, now you can actually uh, fit this, uh, fit this in. Uh, so you have this option over here to export and you can save this as, uh, what is it? Yeah, Jamovi template, which I already did and I already uh, pre-registered. So if I uh, close this and I go back to our directory, you see there's an OMT file. So I can just open this OMT, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I closed the Jamovi. It's better to just open it. So I'm gonna open the OMT file from Jamovi. Also make this, um, like uh, uh, default, I haven't registered this with my system, but let's just open the Jamovi and then I'll, I'll ask it to open uh, this template file. Just going a bit slow, so be patient with me. Okay. So if we go over here and we open, you can, um, So I'm just gonna can't see this. Okay, so you can uh, browse, go in the directory, and then you can open the ONT file. And you can see that it opens a template. Now it has all the fields and it should have all the, um, uh, the analysis already uh, here. So you see the analysis are empty. And now the only thing that I need to do is import your real data so I'm going to 
can go over here and use your real data. So I'm importing your, your real data and it was successfully imported. So we have these 25 uh, questions over here. And the nice thing about Jamovi is that it's supposed to dynamically update everything uh, on, on the right, depending on the, the data that's, that's on the left. So you can see immediately, just because I pre-registered this before, it's already showing me all, all the results. So you can see that over here we have you know, p-value, if we care about p-values, uh, lower than 0.05. Uh, uh, so it, it says at least with a neutral, everybody is going to do uh, everybody is going to do pre-registrations in open science. <laughs> but if the default is no, you can nudge people to not do open science. So I think just by the fact that you're here in this workshop, I guess you're open science oriented. So nudging and defaults have a, a dark side. So this is at least in terms of uh, pre-registrations. And I think the, the data is very similar and a little bit even more extreme in terms of sharing. So if the sharing at the university, that's the default. Um, so these are very, very similar. So most people are saying uh, yes. So under the default is yes. And under the neutral, most people are doing open science. But then if the default is no, and most of the people at the university are not doing uh, open science, which is, unfortunately is the case with HKU and most of the universities that I know, then uh, more than the majority or like a split of, of uh, half, half, four and four are not, are not going to do pre-registrations and sharing. So we found support for the, um, for the default uh, default effect. So you can see the differences between the, the different conditions. So that's a really nice, uh, cool thing that you can do with Jamovi. So you uh, make a data plan, you upload this as a template. And finally, after you collect the data, it takes exactly five seconds, just like you saw, to upload your real data and show the results. And, and now you can start writing your, your document. So um, I'm gonna no, 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 save this, it does not matter but I want to show you how, how I pre-registered this. So what I did is that I took, because we did a replication of uh, default eff effect in the last uh, semester. Um, so uh, Shiyuan and, and Nadia worked together to do a default effect. There were two other students, but I took their template. What you can see over here is that I just, uh, I took the template and I adjusted this. So I wrote like an abstract and it looks like a manuscript. So in a pre-registered experiment with this workshop participants, we ran a conceptual application of this uh, default effect. And be because this was a pre-registration, I didn't know if we found support or failed to find support. Now I know that we found support and now I only need to put in the statistics in the p-value and, and the confidence intervals. But then I just wrote, okay, so this is based on a design. So this is a science paper. It was published in Science 2003. So I used this, it has over a thousand uh, uh, citations uh, so far. So it's a very, uh, it's a classic paper. And then you have defaults, you have opt-in, opt-out or neutral control. And then I wrote my hypothesis. So uh, thanks to uh, the students. I didn't need to work very hard for this. I had also already analyzed the original, so I just took their, their analysis and, and I used this in there. So these are my benchmarks in terms of comparing what our results are to what was, uh, what was done in the original uh, that this is a, a conceptual replication of. And if you look at the design, actually it has all the design. Uh, actually, I didn't change enough over here, so I, I made a little bit of a mistake with organ donations, but you can see over here, opt-in is no open science, uh, opt-out uh, do open science, and uh, you know, neutral. Uh, so I should have cleaned this up a little bit better, but I think you get the idea. So over here in the methods, what you see is that I, I kind of uh, wrote what the, the measures are, so what the manipulation is and what the practices are. So there's both pre-registration and the sharing. It's called the one and zero. I think overall, not a good, not, not a bad job for uh, pre-registration given that I did this in uh, less than half an hour. So all this, and then finally, this is where uh, you put in the results. So I said uh, we generated the dummy uh, data and simulated the data attached Jamovi template. Now, uh, mine perhaps is not as comprehensive as what uh, Shiren and Nadia did. So if I go and I have a look at theirs, their pre-registration was, was really nice. So if we, if we wanna see this on uh, the Open Science Framework, we can open uh, their project. So this is 
this has been uh, registered uh, during their semester. Uh, so they, um, you know, designed everything, they did the Qualtrics and then uh, generated some data and designed the Jamovi. So you can see if we go to the pre-registration, it's very, very similar to what we have over here. The Jamovi is over here in the analysis. Uh, but if we look at uh, their uh, pre-registration compared to mine, it's so much more uh, extensive. So you can actually go, everything is open, everything is shared. So uh, this is one of uh, 72 projects that the students uh, that the students did. This is this is one of the, the great ones um, that we're writing right now for uh, for publication. So you can see uh, this is just a pre-registration. So it's pretty amazing that they did a power analysis and they analyzed how many we need we need to run and they already wrote the results and they had a really really long introduction. So all this is. Uh, in the in the pre-registration before data collection. So the students did an amazing job over here and they did this based on a template that we created that you can take, uh, adjust, use in any way that, that you want. Um, the students that are working with me in the courses uh, will be will be using this. And I think some of them are here in this in this uh, workshop. So once you have a template, once you have examples, once everything is clear, it doesn't take a very long time to do a pre-registration. Perhaps you'd need more than half an hour before a workshop to get everything uh, done correctly. We also do peer review before the pre-registration. So we get uh, two students, two student group working independently and then they peer review each other. Then we have the teaching assistants Then we have external peer reviewers coming from Twitter. And then of course I go over things to make sure that it's okay. So there's a lot of ways by which we can uh, catch all, all the errors, but you can see this, it's very comprehensive uh, and very, very well done. Uh, so if our students, uh, undergraduate students starting from second year to fourth year can do this kind of amazing job with a pre-registration, I don't honestly completely understand why some senior scholars say that this takes a lot of time or that it's uh, uh, very, very complicated. Uh, we, we're doing this in all of our, uh, I'm doing this in all of my uh, all of my courses. So thanks for playing along with me. This was good. I, I enjoyed this. So hopefully this gave you like a good, a good idea of uh, what does a pre-registration look like? Is it really that complicated? Um, does it does it uh, take a lot of time? So once you've done a good pre-registration, after you collect the data, you just plug it in to your template in Jamovi. If you have an R code, then of course you just run the R code. If it's R markdown, immediately all the the, the output is in there. And if it's R markdown, you even have the results section already written written out. So in the different workshops that I give, I try to automate things as much as possible so that it really takes away all the pressure from you in your pre-registrations. So um, once you have this kind of structure in place, I just wanted to open by saying it's very, very simple to do a pre-registration, especially if you've done this a few times before. So before uh, we've done a, a default uh, effect. Um, so I, it was very easy for me to just take this uh, as is, make some adjustments, uh, delete, add some stuff, uh, adjust this to the workshop, um, and so forth. So we did all of this. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to tell you that if you want to look at our students' uh, report, everything is open. So I showed you a little bit of the default effect bias example. But if you want to see what our students did in 2019, uh, I think they've done a, a remarkable, remarkable job. So I'll show you just what that looks like. So I'll open this error table. Hopefully my computer wouldn't crash. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, all right, so you can see that we've done all these replications. So we have different teams, uh, group A, group B for each one of the replication targets. So this is study one, study two. Uh, one replication was done on MTurk with Americans. One of them was done on prolific, but you can see that each one of these teams had a pre-registration. So you can go actually and follow these links. You can have a look at their final reports. So everything is open and shared in the spirit of, of open science. So if you open this up, you'll be able to see their final reports and all the raw data and all their analysis in either Jamovi or, or in R. Um, so, okay. 
Yeah, so actually you can it, like, feel free to uh, come in and learn from, from our students in terms of how to do a good pre-registration. So all of these are OSF uh, links and all of these are Dropbox, uh, Dropbox links. So you can go and have a lot of examples. These are uh, just from last semester, so 22 of these. Actually, we have, we have 72, 72 of these and I'll, I'll show a little bit of that perhaps uh, uh, later. All right, so that was like a good uh, introduction to what is a pre-registration, where you can find some examples, what does it look like, the whole procedure. So hopefully, even if you don't really understand what the whole thing is about, like why do pre-registrations, why is this even necessary? Hopefully by now you already know that it's uh, um, technically easy. Uh, you go on a website, Open Science Framework, and you do this kind of uh, registration. Uh, with a few a few clicks, uh, in terms of you know writing the the documents, you have uh, templates. In terms of data analysis uh, templates, it's Jamovi. It looks like SPSS, so you can do uh, clicks. If you prefer R code, you can just use use the R code, and then you go pre-register. And after you pre-register, uh, you do you do the the data collection. So. Um, so that, that's what pre-registration is about. Now we're gonna talk about, so how are we doing with the time? Okay, not too bad. So less than half an hour. So we're, we're doing good time. So before I, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about what is a pre-registration and what are registered reports, which is the next generation pre-registration, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the science crisis. Now, typically I give an hour and a half on this uh, and a lot of slides. And I did this last uh, last year in this uh, workshop and people told me this was way too long. So I'm gonna give you a teaser. It's gonna be something like six, seven slides. But if you want in this uh, presentation already, there are some hidden slides that if you downloaded, um, you know, you have this, oh, I'm not even showing you the link. So there's a link over here on, on the bottom. So you can download, you can download the slides. Um, but if you want to know more, then there's a lot of stuff uh, on my website. So if uh, we kind of go back to uh, my website over here, what you can see is that I have some sections on the open science and the replication crisis. So if we go, um, yeah, so if we go over here, to look, uh, you can uh, hear me talking about my journey to open science. Uh, how did I come to do open science and why that is? So this is a talk that I gave uh, in, in Brazil and this is a talk that I gave this semester uh, for, for my students at Advanced Social Psychology and Judgment Decision Making. Um, but then you can also see other people uh, talking about the, the science uh, crisis and all that. So there's a lot of information for you if you want to, uh, want to know more. I'm going to close a few things because my computer is struggling. Um, let's close this one as well. Okay. All right. So very briefly, I just want to say, starting from 2011, um, we realized we had uh, some problems uh, in terms of failures to replicate. It took us about uh, three, four years to look into things. In 2015, 2016, we already realized we're, we're in trouble because a lot of famous classic findings in social psychology failed to replicate. So over here you can see all sorts of uh, examples. So for example, Power Posing, which is the number one TED Talk, a New York Times bestseller book. Uh, we failed to replicate this uh, many times. And then we have uh, this uh, issues with, with embodiment. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, most time it doesn't. Now there's this whole debate about what this means. Uh, ego depletion is, is something that I, I personally uh, cared uh, much about and was a, a very big shock and disappointment to me because a lot of people that I know and, and work with and, and, and care about them and their work, uh, this, this failed to replicate uh, twice. And then priming, elderly priming. So if you want to know more about this, you're welcome to attend my courses and of course everything I share on YouTube and on the Open Science Framework so you can, you can dig more uh, into that. Now in terms of um, mass replication efforts. So we've been mass mobilizing different labs from around the world. You can see it's called Many Labs. So this is Many Labs 2. Uh, these were different projects. So here we had 100 replications with a lot of labs from around the world. Here we had 
uh, 21 uh, famous studies that were published in Science or in Nature. So this is a summary, a summary uh, that I took from Twitter. Brian Osek is the director of the Center of Open Science that does the open science framework that we just used in order to conduct our pre-registration. So he built this tool because for a very long time he was looking for a website where he can store and share uh, his materials, where he can do pre-registrations, and there wasn't any. So he built one, and right now, because of him and because of the nonprofit that he's headed, you know, the Center of Open Science, we now have this amazing tool um, called the, the Open the Open Science Framework. So what we have is that from 2015, from these 97 replications that originally had significant effect, when we try to repeat this, only 36 of them, 36 percent, uh, were were significant in the same uh, direction, and of those the effect size uh, was about half. Then people said, okay, you just try to replicate psychological science and JPSP, these uh, social psychology journals, we didn't expect very much. But if you try to publish science and nature, then everything is going to replicate. But once again, out of 21, only 13 replicated and the effect size were about half of the, of the original. So that was uh, disappointing. Finally published in Nature Human Behavior. This really large um, mass collaboration, many labs too. Look at all these samples, how many labs involved? 36 nations, 186 authors. So really social psychologists coming together to try and understand, so what replicates, what doesn't replicate? And finally, you can see that successfully replicated 14 of the 28 and really the effects are, are very disappointing, much weaker. Than in the than in the originals. Um, so what you can see here below is the one case study that I, I teach in my in the first class in my courses. This is about ego depletion. So the first one in 2016, I think 20, 24 labs uh, found nothing, a very very weak effects, and then the original authors, uh, so Kathleen Voss over here said that you, they didn't know how to do this correctly. So if they would do it, then they would find something. And it took them two more years to finish their own replications. And then once again, they found a very, very, very weak effect. Um, so both together, very disappointing findings for one of our biggest, um, biggest findings in social psychology. So ego depletion, uh, at least to me, is no longer a phenomena that I that I trust to to replicate well to work. And if anything is in there, it's a very weak effect, uh, much much smaller than any, anything that we have in our books or we tell our students or practitioners. So that's really disappointing. So if we try to summarize this, thank you, Brian Nosek, um, you can see the replication rate is about 47%. Now, I don't know what you feel about this, but you need to take into consideration that we expected higher. And we especially expected higher because all these journals, psychological science, JPSP, science and nature, and all these classic findings, especially ego depletion, we expected close to, to 100. Uh, I know that's not realistic because, you know, randomness of the universe, all sorts of noise in there, different labs doing different things. But we definitely did not expect 47% and we did not expect our effect sizes to be about half. So that was an indication for us that something is perhaps uh, not quite right. Um, and then people were saying, okay, so this must be a psychology problem. This cannot be um, uh, relevant for, for anything, anything else. Uh, but since then, we started doing replications in all sorts of other fields. Um, we in psychology said, so medicine, chemistry, computer science, can you please show us that things are working better in your fields? So they started to do a little bit of that. And then all these headlines started coming out. No, nope, it's not a problem in psychology. If anything, psychology is doing much better than other fields. So you can see we have a big problem uh, in economics, we have a big problem in medicine, chemical research, cancer research, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, this is from just last, last month. To me, this was really su surprising. Uh, computer science for me is as close as we can get perhaps to math in terms of you know, algorithms and all this. But if we have a replication crisis, <laughs> In inability to reproduce and replicate uh, things in computer science, then we really have a big, a big issue. Now, I'm I keep track of of 
what the hard sciences are doing and of course what's happening in the social sciences. So there's a hidden slide about social sciences, but I just want to summarize what we know when we know very, very little. We don't really know what's going on because we haven't done replications. But now that we started doing replications, we realize we're in re real trouble. So these initial replications were actually not by academics. They were done by uh, commercial companies that were trying to understand is academia reliable or not. And you can see that their conclusion was that it's not. Um, some people pushed back on this and said all sorts of reasons for this. So this one over here, cancer biology has been running for a while. They wanted to do 50 replications, but out of those only 18 um, seem to be <clears throat> um, you know, have the, the, the enough material to just begin the replication. So 32 out of the 50, we don't even know what happened there. We don't, we couldn't trace, reproduce the methods uh, and, and the procedures. So we wanted to start with 50, but we ended up just starting with 18. And out of the 18, we completed about 14 so far. And of them, uh, only nine uh, replicated. But even then, uh, the effects were uh, much weaker. So in psychology, you can say, okay, ego depletion doesn't replicate, power posing doesn't replicate. Nobody really got hurt. Maybe people that expected to get a job um, or, or do better in negotiation didn't. But when you see this kind of problem in cancer biology, when you see this in the hard sciences, uh, it's heartbreaking because uh, this means that people suffer. This means that people uh, die. Most of the people in my department um, you know, they study, um, they teach, they're involved in some way in neuroscience. Um, so we have a, a very strong neuroscience team of, over here. And most of our students have some training in neuroscience. Neuroscience has, has uh, similar issues in the sense that uh, samples are very small. If you bring in 10, 20 people to the scanner, that's a lot of time, investment, resources, but samples are very, very small. So we don't have a lot of, of power. Uh, everything is very noisy. When you look at a brain scan, you know, there's all sorts of ways of interpreting this. Show this to 10 different scholars, they might tell you different things. You have different techniques of analyzing them and, and, and looking at what is a signal and what is noise. So in terms of neuroscience and the medical science, we now understand that if anything, because of the small samples, because of all the noise, because the pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, patents and everything, all the incentives involved, we have a real, <clears throat> a real issue with things. And the real issue is just even understanding what was done before because people don't share. People just don't, don't tell you what it is that they've done. So coming into HKU about two years ago, <clears throat> I decided that the only thing that I'm going to do with my students is pre-registered replications and pre-registered meta-analyses. And in, in our courses, we started doing a replication. So the students, just like you saw with default effect, default bias, um, looked at the classics. Some of them are classics published in science, you know, a thousand, <clears throat> a thousand citations, and tried to reproduce these. Some of them are very simple, like the default effect you saw. It's like a very, very simple three condition. I can do this in Qualtrics very, very easily. But some of them are a little bit more elaborate. And some of them involve um, a deeper, deeper analysis. Now, one of the reasons why I decided to shift from what I was doing before to doing judgment and decision making is because I had some intuition or hope that judgment decision making replicates a little bit better. Now, what you can see over here is that our replication rate, if you remember the general replication rate is about 50%, social sciences a lot lower, perhaps in the hard sciences. And this is, these are the, like the optimistic ones. I can tell you all sorts of things that might reduce this estimate, but our a replicability rate is closer to 70%, uh, which is amazing, not just because it means that judgment decision making is, is doing well, it also means that students, undergraduate students at the University of Hong Kong are able to do uh, very good replications and extensions and find classic findings. And even in the ones that didn't, that didn't work out, we found all sorts of reasons for how to, you know, what went wrong and how we can improve on these. And we published this together with our students. So the students that take uh, part in, in my classes, finally we submit this to the journals and some of these are already, already published. So we, we've, done, we've done a lot of these. If you wanna have a look at the, uh, you know, the, the findings and uh, how to do this, how to join us, then you can kind of like scan this and go over this. So this is kind of like a very brief take. What is the open science? Uh, we're doing replications, pre-registered replications, and we're trying to do this on a mass scale. And even here at HKU, we've been doing more, more and more of these 
Um, so, um, yeah. All right. Um, let me think for a second. Okay. So, I'm going to very briefly uh, discuss privilege situations, even though you saw uh, already uh, what, what's happening. And just look at the chat, see if there's some no, questions. Okay, so if, if everything is clear, then I think we can proceed. Um, most of these slides are not mine. So I took from a lot of people uh, who I learned from. Uh, most of all, I think Chris Chambers and Brian Nosek of the Center of Open Science. So Chris Chambers is the one behind Register reports, so we'll talk about this. People from the Open uh, Open Science Center, uh, Center of Open Science. Uh, a lot of really good people. Felix over here does amazing slides. So uh, each one of those, so this is in the cloud folder. If you'll go to the cloud folder, there are some, um, yeah. so if we go back to our cloud folder, we'll see that there are actually some presentations about uh, registered reports so you can see um, Chris Chambers is here and Felix is here and uh, Campbell is here. So I took a lot from, from those slides, but I didn't take everything. So you can actually go and have a look and, and learn more uh, learn more about that. Um, okay, so pre-registrations. Um, this paper by Brian Osek, I think this, when was this, 2017, 2018? So this just came out. I considered pre-registration to be a, a revolution. And I think I really um, appreciate that. So this is published in PNAS, that this is uh, getting to be more, more and more the standard. So hopefully, even though HKU does not necessitate this uh, or demands this of us, hopefully, especially the early career researchers, the students, I will understand that this is happening. So if you want you know, to be attractive for the job market, it doesn't matter if you're in industry or academia, you want to at least know what pre-registration is and have some experience in this, because once you, you, you will be looking for a job, people will, will demand this of you. So this is it's no longer like uh, something uh, you know, trendy that you know, hipsters are doing on the, on the side, you know, these open science movement guys. Uh, this this is published in the best of journals and people uh, more and more uh, journals are, are demanding. I'm just going to tell you that you have uh, a few options of where to pre-register. So I, I showed you the open science framework in terms of uh, there's a number of templates and uh, you have 48 hours to decide and then you can keep some pre-registrations private. But some people are saying this is already a little bit too complicated for me. I want to be able to uh, pre-register a hypothesis within you know five five minutes so you can go on as predicted this is I think one of the first tools that was out there and the only thing that you need to do is an answer very short nine questions uh, if you have collaborators all of them need to approve and then you can decide when you want to make this uh, publish uh, public uh, or not uh, in terms of all the forms and the, the, the templates you, you have this you have this here now, instead of, of listening to uh, to me talk about this, I want to play a little bit to you uh, from Daniel uh, Simmons. Uh, so Simmons is maybe I can just show you this because it's so. There's a new journal, and this is going to be a very high impact journal. It doesn't have impact factor yet because it's fairly new, but it's called Advances in Methods and Practices in Psychological Science. So almost everything that comes out from the APS, from the Psychological Science Journals, there's quite a few of those. Uh, so Psychological Science, Directions in Psychological Science, cur Current Directions in Psychological Science, Perspective Psychological Science, all of these are very high impact uh, journals. And, and this one is definitely um, a, a very, very important one. Um, so you can see the editor over here, Daniel Simmons, has this editorial and, and he gave an interview. And basically what this journal aims to do is promote uh, open science uh, practices or any practices actually support methods that anything that can improve the way that we uh, do uh, psychological uh, science. So it's about five minutes uh, videos. I think it's uh, really clear because whatever I babble over here is not going to do a very convincing job. So um, I think uh, listen to him and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what he 
is uh, suggesting and what uh, my experience is from running these uh, these pre registrations. So um, about five minutes, and then I'll, I'll continue the talk. We'll take a, a break, um, and then we'll continue. So first of all, we'll watch this, and then the break. A pre-registration is when you specify in advance what you plan to do. So what your methods will be, how you're going to collect your data, how you're going to analyze your data. And that's essentially all it is. And a lot of people feel that pre-registration is going to somehow stifle exploratory work or stifle their ability to look fully at their data. And I think that's a misunderstanding. Right? You don't have to pre-register every detail of every study in advance. It's useful um, to specify what it is that you're planning on doing, but sometimes you don't have a hypothesis in advance. Sometimes you just collect a lot of data and you want to analyze it. So I've sometimes collected personality measures alongside a cognitive task. I don't have any predictions about those. I'm just curious whether I can find any associations that are there that might be worth looking into later. What a pre-registration gives you is the power to say this was a prediction. This was something we wanted to do in advance and we were testing a hypothesis. So here's an interesting question. Let's say you pre-register something, then you look fully at your data. Uh, in addition to the pre-registered analysis, you look at everything and you, you realize, oh, we should have been testing this other hypothesis. Well, that's great. That's discovery. That's not a confirmatory hypothesis test. It's something that you discovered by looking at your data. It was driven by your data. And you wouldn't have tested that new hypothesis had you not already explored your data. So that's the source of inspiration for the next study, the one that tests that hypothesis directly, that's planned to test it. The first time I pre-registered a study, it was really a shock to me uh, how many decisions we actually make after the fact. And we don't really think about that because as we're making decisions about how to analyze our data or when to stop data collection, all of those decisions are completely rational and justifiable. There's nothing wrong with any of those decisions. And once we know the data, it's easy to say why this is a completely appropriate way to do this, or this is a completely appropriate way to test the same hypothesis. But they're also completely flexible. And what that means is that if you're trying to test your hypothesis and there are 10 different ways that you could test the same question, and you make a decision about which of those 10 to do based on your data, any p-values are invalid. So pre-registration is just a way of helping to remind you, to help you remember exactly what it was that you thought was going to happen when you started the study. We know from decades of memory research that distortion of our memories can happen, right? that we can remember having planned to do one thing when in reality we plan to do something different. I found in my own research that I'll start a study, I'll pre-register it, and then data collection takes six months or a year, depending on what I'm doing. And only then could I look back at our plan for the analysis and say, oh, here's what I said I was going to do. If I had tried to remember that, I would have had no idea. A lot of people are concerned about pre-registration taking up a lot of extra time and a lot of extra effort. But in reality, all it's doing is front-loading work that you'd have to do anyway. So you're essentially writing your method section in advance. The more onerous part, the more difficult part, is writing up your analysis plan. And that takes a lot more thought and a lot more effort, but it has a huge advantage, which is that once you have your data, you can go from collecting your data to having analyzed it and writing your paper much faster. So there are a lot of places where you can pre-register your study. Um, there are a number of websites that can take care of that. One is the Open Science Framework, and you can create an account there. It's free. You can create a project where you upload a Word file that describes your pre-registration, or you can use their wiki editing tools to, pre to do it, or you can follow one of the pre-existing templates that walk you through the steps of things that you should specify. You can keep it private uh, until it's published, so there's no chance of somebody coming along and looking at your pre-registration and then running your own study. There's As Predicted, which is a website created by Yuri Simonson and uh, Leif Nelson and, and Joe Simmons, that allows you to kind of give a summary of a pre-registration. It's not a really in-detail one, but it creates a PDF that says, hey, here are the measures we're going to collect, here's what we're going to analyze, here are our hypotheses. Ideally, once you start developing a pre-registration model for your lab or for your research, once you've done it once, you can just copy what you did and make tweaks to it, and it's much simpler that way. So there are a lot of efforts underway to try and increase the likelihood that people will pre-register. and. Part of that involves pointing out the benefits to the researcher of pre-registering. So the ease with which you can confirm that you were testing what you said you would, uh, the speed of going from the final study to 
publication. There have been a number of efforts to improve pre-registration. One is to just make it easy to do. So sites like As Predicted make it trivially easy to do the minimal pre-registration. Um, other things that have been done to encourage it, there have been a number of papers describing the benefits of pre-registration and why it will help the field as a whole. Another thing that's been done more recently is that a number of journals have adopted badges to signal to the community that this study was pre-registered. A large part of it is just making people aware that this is something you can do because the field never really did it before. So registered reports are a relatively new thing in the field. Registered reports are again this idea that you write the entire paper before you have the data, uh, specifying the hypotheses, the background, the motivation for it, to make sure that it's written in a very neutral way. It could come out in any different pattern. If you're doing a true hypothesis test, you don't know how it's going to come out in advance. So registered reports are a relatively new format, but they're being adopted by a lot of journals. And part of that is through efforts of, of a handful of, of people who've been really promoting this format. Chris Chambers, for example, has really promoted this format and has gotten a number of journals to adopt it. The nice thing about that is it ensures that the way the study is being described is neutral, fair, and open to any possible outcome. So in some ways, registered reports, they don't really slow down the research process. They just change where Okay, so I'm going to stop this here. It keeps on going for, for a, bit, a bit longer, so you can see like we're um, a quarter, three quarters uh, away uh, through this. You're, you're welcome to listen to him. Actually, SPSB has some really good, um, some good talks with some um, very inspiring uh, people. Uh, and, and I like how clear it is what he is describing. He's talking a little bit fast, so I'm just going to like uh, um, say that um, in 2017, uh, I set out to do pre-registrations, uh, pre-registered replications and pre-registered meta-analysis with, with my students. And I had no idea what that looks like. And back then when I was trying to ask people, so uh, what can we use? So they showed me all these, uh, all these templates and then the open science framework was still a little bit uh, uh, complicated. It's just three years ago, but, but the open science framework really came a long way. Uh, but there was as predicted. And initially, I was really concerned. I had a lot of worries about how long it's going to take me. Do I really know everything in advance? It's not the kind of training that I had in my PhD on how to do uh, research. Uh, but the thing is, is that given everything that I came to know about open science, I was not very um, confident that, that, that I know that what I'm doing is, is correct. So, Pre-registrations really allowed me to think about things more carefully in advance and really have to put down everything on paper and think about things. So it used to be that I rushed into, into things. So I had an idea, immediately I would open the call checks, put a bunch of things in there. Uh, if I had funding or participant pool, I would immediately rush uh, uh, to run this. Um, and then, you know, looking back at, at at, at that time, we had a lot of incentives, so a lot of things did not did not come out. But I already knew from the experience of open science that once you know you ran something and it didn't work out, you want to try and make the most of it. So go back to your data set and see if there's if there's something something in there. But that's the thing that when you go back to a data a data set that was used to test one hypothesis, uh, which it did not find any support for. And then you look for a different hypothesis uh, in there. Even if you found something, uh, given your analysis of the data, you really uh, need to confirm this again because you have not pre-registered these hypotheses. You just came, came across those. So this is exploratory research. So we really need to separate our exploration from um, um, our confirmation. And this is what pre-registration helped me to do. It also helped me uh, be more careful and more structured about you know how how I do things uh, in terms of the workflow. So we'll go a little bit more into that in in more detail before we we move on to the workflow and what is registered report and how it's different from pre-registration. I want to share uh, the number of uh, you know uh, registrations uh, on the Open Science Framework. So this I took from. Uh, uh, Ryan Osek. So just in terms of then, if you're thinking, uh, are people still uh, people really using the Open Science Framework? So obviously, you can see at the beginning it wasn't uh, that that um, common. 
2016 when I just found out about this, you know, a bunch of people, I would say most of them are in the Netherlands or Scandinavia, or it took a while for people to pick up. But now, I think 2020, uh, we're, we're way up. So this is growing exponentially. So you want to be one of these people who are joining um, this sort of thing rather than people that are lagging behind not knowing what this is. But also in terms of the study registrations, so the pre-registrations used to be uh, uncommon. I remember in 2017, we joined something called the pre-registration challenge. So one of my uh, students uh, won a uh, 1,000 US dollars just for running a pre-registration. Uh, so it helped him to collect some data and, and, and so forth. So the center of open science was trying to promote people doing pre-registrations. Not all of people were doing this, which is why in 2017 uh, they, they tried to um, reward this. I was trying to convince our university and maybe Hong Kong that they would give some uh, incentives in, uh, in trying to promote pre-registrations in Hong Kong because it's still not very common and people still think that this is a little bit too complicated, but it's really not. You just need to get people to, to start doing those. Uh, sometimes incentives like uh, money or you know, funding uh, helps with this. Uh, last year, we had the Open uh, Science, Hong Kong Open Science Principles for Changing Assessment uh, and Hong Kong University signed it. So I think people in the future will be assessed based on uh, their pre-registrations and data sharing and, and stuff like that. So I'm very happy to see uh, this trend, but there's also an ability, Open Science Framework uh, with the Center of Open Science now has the ability to take your Open Science Framework project and turn it into a, a preprint. So the number of people sharing their preprints before it's sent to the journal, uh, before it's published, it increases. Everything that we do, everything that I submit to the journals uh, is available as preprints. Uh, I welcome uh, peer review. I don't, um, I don't worry at all that anybody would come and take this from me because it's posted as a preprint uh, with my name and, and my collaborators. So more and more preprints in the center of open science and the open science framework has a lot to do with, with promoting uh, this uh, sort of thing. All right, so before we move on, I feel like we deserve a break. So we're gonna take, um, uh, let's, do, let's do a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back, um, so now it's 2.26, so we'll come back at uh, 2.35 and continue this. So I had a few questions which have now disappeared because uh, Zoom crashed on me, but I'll, I'll try and make this, uh, I'll, I'll try and get back to this. So one of them was asking me about um, a secondary data analysis. So if there's an existing data set, so what can be done about this? So actually we've developed, not we, the, the open science community has developed a really good template about how to do pre-registration uh, for this. I think by now this is already uh, published. So if you look it up, I think on Google. So we have, um, yeah, so they have a really good, uh, a really good template on this. Um, so you can just, just look it up, not this one, it's this one, I think. Yeah, so if you go on their OSF page, you can open this. And um, so Alma over here, I think has everything, including R code and what it is that you need in order to uh, do this. And also if you go on the OSF, it will, it will show you, um, I, I think there's, there's a template that's built in into OSF on how to do this secondary uh, data analysis. And also in our cloud folders, um, uh, there is, so if we go back to the uh, workshop over here, there's some templates. If you go over here on the templates, then you'll see there's, uh, if you want for qualitative research, or if you want for fMRI, or if you want, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that, that you guys can see me. So if you can just say yes, can see you, everything is okay. So I'm not, okay, good. So I was worried that I'm talking to myself. Happens, happens sometime with Zoom. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, okay, so this was the question about an existing data set. So I just want to say by now we have a template for everything. And if we don't have a template, we're working on it. So if there's something that you haven't found a template for, uh, I don't know, EEG, whatever your field is is into, uh, then I, and you can't find it yourself, then, then let me know and I'll help you find it. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that almost everything right now we have a template for our, our group that's working on this. The other question that I had 
was about uh, IRB. So what does the IRB say about me sharing everything? So I just wanted to make sure that we're like on the same page. So of course, we protect uh, the identity of our participants and we wanna make sure that there's no identified uh, information. So everything that I run, I run on Amazon, Mechanical Turk and Prolific. Um, the last time that I ran something in the actual uh, lab was you know, two years ago. So I, I don't run these anymore because I'm doing these mass replication efforts and in my field in judgment and decision-making, uh, we don't really, um, and we don't need more than that. So these uh, samples are very convenient. They're quite representative, or at least the results that we get from them are very consistent with other uh, findings that we have in judgment decision-making. So for example, when we ran things with the Hong Kong students and when we ran things with students elsewhere in the world, and when we ran this with field samples, we get very similar uh, results when we run this with, uh, you know, comparing Amazon mechanical to, to prolific, so Americans and Brits, we get very consistent results. So it's, at least in terms of judgment and decision-making, I am not worried about this. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I run Amazon mechanical Turk and prolific with Qualtrics. And as long as I don't collect their, you know, uh, MTurk uh, ID, even if I collect this, you know, the only person that can put this together is Amazon. So actually, I don't know who my participants are. But even if I did, let's say that you're collecting data with a um, participant pool, you can anonymize uh, your data. And there are some very clear protocols uh, on how, how to do this. Uh, in most cases, this is pretty straightforward. One thing that I wanted to show you is, for example, with Dan Quintana over here, um, he was saying, but sometimes I have some medical information which is identifiable. So even if I anonymize everything, because I am from a small uh, I don't know, village in the Netherlands and I run this, so it's enough that people know what your gender is, what your age is, and perhaps, uh, I don't know, that you have this, this and that uh, heart disease for them to know uh, who you are. So even if you anonymize in terms of taking away their personal names, sometimes people can still uh, know something about you, um, about your participants. So there is a way of dealing with that. So what Dan, Dan Quintana over here, and he does amazing tutorials in the sense that he uh, takes you step by step on our code together with you. He does these sessions live, which is absolutely amazing. And he, he wrote a tutorial about if you have a data set and it has certain features and you want to share that, but you have a problem with uh, you know, anonymity or identifiability, what you can do is create a synthetic uh, data set that has exactly the same feature, but doesn't involve any, any personal data. So it randomizes the data between them, but at the end, the means, the standard deviations, the statistical tests come exactly the same. So a synthetic data uh, allows you to share the data set without anything that might be linked into to a specific um, a specific individual. So even if you have some concerns, let's say you're in the medical sciences or you're doing this on uh, specific target populations and you really worry about um, identifiability, then you create uh, synthetic uh, data sets. And now we have uh, packages, R packages that do this uh, uh, fairly easy. And people like Dan Quintana that really take you step by step and show you how to do this thing. Now, if you want to know what our IRB uh, looks like, um, we share everything so you can have a look at our IRB. The way that we do this with uh, replication and extensions is that we uh, pre-register, we do the IRB process once. And because these are replications and because these are published uh, findings, as long as it's judgment and decision making, as long as it's a, a, a replication of, of a published um, finding, as long as it's uh, online, as long as there's no uh, potential harm, um, then we're able to do uh, these mass replications without coming back to the IRB every time. So you do this at the beginning of the semester or the academic year, and then the bulk of all the replications uh, done together for that year, you can do, you can fit this in for uh, one IRB. So you can take our IRB and fit this to, especially if you're in, in Hong Kong, almost everything here should be exactly the same for HKUST or CUHK. Should be pretty straightforward for you to adapt this. Now, generally, just so you know, everything that we uh, that we do is shared openly. So if you go back to my, my webpage and you want to know more about our project or you want to find 
um, our templates or our resources or our ethics uh, approval or anything else that you might need, um, then you can go over here. This is the main page. So over here on the, on the left, you can see it's master applications and extensions. And over here, you can see get involved resources. So if we jump to this, this is a nice air table. Uh, if you want to collaborate with us and join our mass replication effort, then you can just like follow this uh, link. If you want to see our student reports from last year, two years ago, you can go on this link. Many, uh, it's all these things, but then we have a lot of guides. So I'll go over some of these uh, uh, guides uh, in detail with you, especially the template. So I just want to say uh, for some of these, uh, we have uh, a really good uh, uh, cloud folder. So you can see over here, replications resource cloud folder. So if you like double click on this, so it will open our cloud folder so you'll be able to uh, go and have a look uh, uh, in terms of everything that we that we have in our project and as you can see you have our ethics approval so you can just like go into uh, that link click on this see uh, all the years that we ran this what our ethics approval is and generally i would say that as long as uh, there's no way to link this back to the individual there's absolutely no uh, problem in sharing this if anything uh, the ethics uh, committee or, or HKU, uh, HKU uh, I, I think, uh, promotes uh, sharing so that everything will be reproducible. So other people will be able to see what it is that we've done, learn from this, extend from this, perhaps help, help us catch, catch errors. If we don't share anything, uh, the world will never know what it is that, that we've done. Uh, and even if you have some concerns, there's always some ways. So maybe you don't want to share everything, but at least share what it is that, that you can. So hopefully at some point, HK will shift the default, share everything, unless. I can tell you uh, that as a reviewer, I joined something called the Pro Initiative. So peer review openness initiative, where I don't review any papers that don't share the data and, and their code, or explain why this is not possible and right now we know that there are ways to like it's always possible you can even create synthetic data sets but there's no uh, excuse for not uh, sharing everything that you have we now understand that we have a reproducibility replication crisis so we need to share everything we can't just trust uh, authors you know based on their words we we want to work together in order to catch errors and 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 make sure that our um Science is reliable. Just imagine yourself, let's say that you're a student and you, you want to do a PhD. Let's say that you see this classic finding from whenever in whatever big big shot uh, journal, and you spend five years trying to uh, you know do an extension, do the next step, build something on top of it, just later to realize that the only reason that this was published is because of, a, of an error that they had in their code. So. Just imagine all the time wasted. You've wasted years of your life and all your training. The participants who took part in this, the taxpayers who paid for the participants and for your salary or scholarship. Just imagine all the waste if we can't really make sure that our um, that our science is reliable. So there's really no excuse for us not sharing the data. Everything that we do is taxpayers' money uh, to let us do, do our job and promote science. Uh, there's no me and you, uh, you know, there's no reason for me to hide anything. We all need to work together in order to address this. What to do when you didn't find support for your hypothesis? So you're saying uh, maybe it still helps if the authors update their OSF page so that the community gets updates. I don't think you understand how extreme I am in my um, direction of open science. Not you and um, you update your osf page you submit this to the journal you submit your um, non-significant null findings um, to the journal and the journal should publish this the results of whether you what you found was significant or not should not be a factor on whether something is published or not the only thing that should uh, be be relevant is you know, how you design the study, whether the research question is interesting uh, and, and valuable and, and would have, uh, you know, uh, impact or increase our knowledge, accumulation of knowledge in the scientific field, uh, whether it's rigorous and the methods are appropriate and, you know, whether everything was done correctly in the sense that, you know, pre-registered and, you know, well-powered samples and the measurements are accurate and, and so forth. Uh, you should not be evaluated based on whether it came out significant or not, because these are things that are out of your hands and other people should know whether something, uh, you know, whether there's support for a phenomena or not. Plus, uh, we don't, we, we wouldn't have a, a good accurate estimate of the effect size if we only publish the things 
that that worked that showed significant uh, p value so if you want to know more about that uh, there's all these courses that I that I gave, which I think uh, um, you, um, you can benefit from or you can join if you want. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about this is, you know, um, right now we try to aggregate uh, all sorts of information. We don't have good tools for aggregation, but Curate Science tries to solve this sort of thing. So at least with replications, whatever the result of the replication, um, you know, depending on, on which journals there are, where they are, if it's a preprint or it's published, they try to aggregate all of this together. So let's say you're interested, uh, what's, what's going on with default bias? Is it here? No, it's not here. Ego depletion. And also, oh yeah, there is some stuff about ego depletion and priming. So you can see an aggregation of all of the findings and then go and see the open science framework or see the PDF. So, and then uh, an average, you know, you can see that the and the sample size and the, the effect size and so forth. So we're trying to get closer to an immediate aggregation of, of uh, findings. Now, this is a really good question to get me back to my, to my uh, uh, slides because I'm, I wanna talk to you about register reports. So the, the rest of the time that we have together, which is the next hour, I'm gonna talk about uh, register reports. I just wanna give a uh, huge credit to Chris Chambers so I'm going to tell you a little bit about his, his journey, but Chris Chambers is the person who initiated a registered report, and thanks to him, uh, we have this, this incredible uh, tool. So um, this paradox that we have, especially I think uh, Tiffany would agree, because she's the one who asked this, this last question, is that uh, even as PhD students, uh, as early career researchers, me personally, I am being uh, evaluated um, for, for the results. So which part of the research study do you believe is most important for advancing your career? The results, but the problem and the paradox in the way that our publication and incentive system is structured is that the results should be the one thing that we can't touch. Uh, we, we're observing a phenomena. We just, you know, we need to report the results as they are, but what to do about this if we can't control the results, but this is uh, the most important thing for advancing their career. There's a real conflict over here between these two. So basically what they're saying is that, you know, in my training is that don't touch this, don't touch the results, just be rigorous, but then make sure that this is amazing. So how to do this? Like you, you know, we have theories, we have hypotheses, we try to make this, you know, a good solid predictions, assuming that our literature is, is solid, but then we don't really have um, any, any impact on, on the results, but this is, you know, every time we have a performance review, every time we apply for the job market, they evaluate us on uh, whether our results were amazing enough to get into the top journals, you know, these amazing uh, JPSP, or if you're in management, then the JPAMJ and all those. So a real conflict over there, and I don't think this is, this is wrong. I think uh, definitely we should not have control over this as a scientist, but the problem is, is that we're being evaluated for that, and this is the main, the main, main issue over here. And I want for a second to discuss the, the life cycle over here. So the life cycle that gets us uh, the, this kind of pressure is that if you think about this uh, life cycle, we, we generate and specify hypotheses. So we've read the literature and we have some ideas and then we, we sit down and we think, uh, what can we do with this? So I read on default uh, bias effect and then I said, could this be uh, also relevant for open science? So if we change the default practices for open science. So I had a hypothesis this morning. I wrote it down in a, in a, you know, in a paper uh, and then I designed a study. So I took uh, some of the other studies that we've conducted before and, and seemed to show support for the default effect. I designed a study. And then uh, typically what I would do is that I immediately would go in and collect the data and then I would analyze the data. Then I would interpret the data to see if there's support for my hypothesis. And then I would try to publish this. So if, if I saw that I haven't been able to answer the question, uh, there's some open issues or something didn't work up in my design, I, I found a flaw of some sort, then I can conduct uh, other experiments, generate hypothesis, design again, and so forth. The problem is, is that we know that in all of these, there are problems. So uh, when we designed the study, at least until uh, in, in psychological science, until 2015, it took us some time to understand that our, our samples are very, very small and not sufficient uh, to, to answer our research questions. When I did my PhD in a management department at the business school, uh, there was 
you know, moderation, mediation, multi-level on a, a sample of 40, 40 participants, obviously this is unsustainable. Even an interaction uh, really gets you, you, you really need to get to some large samples and, and the management literature and up till 2012, um, 15, the social psychology literature, very, very small samples, 20 in each condition, um, and then you find these amazing effects with large effect sizes. So something about the way that we designed things didn't work out. And then we collect the data. But when we analyze this, we realize we didn't really find support for our, our hypothesis. So, you know, we really care about our hypothesis. So we have two options. <laughs> one is that, okay, let's start removing some outliers or see maybe one condition didn't work. And then we're not going to report this because we want to have these amazing results that will get us uh, published in the top journals or uh, worse, um, you know, let's even keep everything, but then let's change the hypothesis. Let's pretend that the hypothesis was something different in order to support what it is that, that we found. So this is supposed to, you know, be conformatory, but what you're doing when you're doing this sort of thing, like you're, you're making this exploratory, but making it look as if it's conformatory, saying, I hypothesized this uh, before, even though you haven't uh, really. And then you have these two big problems of a publication bias. So everything is positive. How can everything be positive? Some things work, some things don't. But when you look at the literature and you realize that all, everything is, is positive, then obviously we have a problem. And then up until 2012, 2015, we haven't been doing replications in some fields like management. We still don't do replications. In social psychology, we started doing replications, but not enough. So uh, for us in HKU, we're doing this in judgment decision making, but there's not that many people around the world dedicated to doing replications. It's still, you know, compared to novel, novel research, com uh, considered to be less attractive. Every time I have a, a review, uh, people saying, okay, so you're doing replications, but wh where is your real research? So for me, first of all, replications are as worthy. Somebody needs to do replications and, and you can learn things from replications that you didn't know. Uh, from, from novel findings from the first time. Now, um, we already have papers that indicate problems in all of this. So for example, how many people are changing the hypothesis or selectively reporting? 50% to 90% in 2012. This is uh, unbelievable. And this is self-report self admission. So people are admitting that they're, they're doing this. And when you look at the estimates, you're getting close to 100% to of people that are, are playing with the, all sorts of things in 2012. And this is un, unscientific. This is, this is really biasing uh, the literature and misleading people. <clears throat> Just imagine you're the poor PhD student that you know, uh, followed up on this literature, not realizing that it's due to selective reporting or changing the hypothesis, the waste of time and resources about this. 92% positive. Uh, publication bias in terms of a lot of file drawers, uh, that, that's, that's horrific. And in terms of replication, how many replications are we doing? One, one in 1,000. So for every 1,000, there's 999 papers that has never been replicated. So you're just, you're trusting something that came out in the 70s and you just keep, keep building on that. And then when you don't find results, you just push this to the file drawer. So a lot of problems. So why am I discussing this with you? because it's very important for us to differentiate in this life cycle uh, between exploratory research and conformatory research. So in the exploratory research, <clears throat> you look around. So maybe you have a data set, you got this from the professor, you collected this yourself. Uh, you want to understand a little bit of what's, what's possible. So let's say you take the World Value Survey or the European Social Survey, and they have uh, a, thousand, a thousand variables. Uh, with uh, 50,000 people, you plot the correlation tables and, and then something comes out significant. And then you say, hooray, now I can write a paper on this. But this is not hooray. You've explored and you found something, but you don't know how reliable this is. And with a 50,000 people in a data set, everything will come out as significant. If, if you have a correlation of 0 0.001, it becomes a, a significant. So um, p-value isn't really uh, very in, in interpretable. And, so large data sets have, have problems, but there's a real problem of using p-values when, when you look at exploratory research. So let's say that you found something here, uh, some effect that you want to look at, then you do conformatory research. <clears throat> and then uh, you have a hypothesis. So let's say that you found this hypothesis from exploratory research on one data set, and then you look at a different data set and test your hypothesis. 
And then you do all sorts of things in order to control the type one error, the type two error. Um, so you need to look at p-values and the power. Do you have sufficient sample in order to test this, this hypothesis and, and find signal or not? And only then, together with measurement, together with other practices, p-value uh, gets a little bit uh, more meaningful. <clears throat> Definitely much more meaningful than it was when it was exploratory. Now, Chris Chambers, so you can see over here, he's now, uh, he's an editor. And he wrote this as an editor in Cortex in 2013. Cortex is, uh, you know, the brain, uh, neuroscience a little bit. So he was asked whether he would like to uh, join the editorial in Cortex because he got to the stage in his career where people appreciate his opinion and he can edit stuff. But Chris was very disappointed uh, with, with this whole uh, life, life cycle and all the problems that came out 2010, 2011, 2012, it became very clear that we have a real, a real issue here. So he said, I am going to join as an editor, but only if you let me do a different kind of report. <clears throat> um, and this, this report is called a registered report. So it's a new publishing initiative. And this is the four central aspects of the registered reports that he wanted uh, to do. First of all, the researchers decide the hypothesis, uh, the experimental procedures, and all the analysis before the data collection. So the amazing thing about registered report is that you take the pre-registration, and the pre-registration is submitted to the journal before data collection. So this is the first time that I know of that a peer review, an official peer review from a journal happens uh, before data collection uh, occurred. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat a little bit, too much talking. <clears throat> so um, you wrote up a pre-registration and you take this pre-registration and you send this off to the, to the journal. And that goes into peer review. And in this peer review, you negotiate, you work together, you collaborate uh, as the author with, with the peer reviewers where you try to reach the best design, the same, the, the best method in order to test the hypothesis uh, over there. Once you arrive at a conclusion, um, both of you agree that this is the best method before data collection, then they give you what's called an in-principle acceptance. It means that no matter what the outcome is, significant, not significant, all findings, yes or no, effect in this direction or that direction, uh, it's going to be published as long as you do your analysis uh, according to the pre-registration plan or you document the deviation. So you can deviate, you can change uh, things, but you need to document all the deviations and everything that you deviated is no longer conformatory, it becomes exploratory. And then future uh, studies will need to uh, conform, uh, confirm this, this again. So this was revolutionary. In the beginning, it started in Cortex um, and people were kind of wondering what this means. So what, so peer review over the, the, the pre-registration, that's really weird. So Chris was saying, look at this uh, traditional model. You develop an idea, design study, collect data, write report, but only here, just before the, pub the publication, only here, after you write the report, you send this off to peer review. Now, what Chris was suggesting is that first you develop an idea and design the study, then you send it off to peer review. Both of you collaborate in order to try and understand what the best design is. They give you in-principle acceptance and only after the in-principle acceptance, uh, uh, you go pre-register and you collect the data. And it doesn't matter what comes up over here. Um, the in-principle acceptance means that you're going, to, <clears throat> um, you're going to publish this. So the only thing that happens in the first uh, stage of the peer review is, are these questions. So you're not evaluated whether the p-value is lower than 0 0.01, but you're evaluated on are the hypothesis well-founded? Are they reasonable, given everything that we know right now from the literature? Are the methods and proposed analysis feasible and enough uh, detail is provided for you to understand what is going on? Is it well-powered? Are the measurements precise? Uh, and, and are there enough uh, controls for you to really uh, make sure that if you find something, it's the thing that you wanted to find? Then at the stage two, the only thing that the reviewers actually do over here in the second stage is to make sure that the authors followed the approved protocol, or if not, uh, that they deviated and explained 
why they, they deviate, and, and then whether the conclusions are justified uh, by, by the data. So uh, this is a little bit how it works. So I explained this. Uh, so you submit this as a stage one, then it's been sent to a peer review, and then you get the in-principle acceptance. And then in the, in the, after you do the research, you submit the stage two and the, um, uh, just update the results with the new results, the discussion, of course, uh, based on the new results. And then you put everything, open science, data materials deposited in a public uh, archive. Uh, and then comes the, the peer review. And the only thing is that they assess compliance and it's published. So uh, all the things, Tiffany, that you were worried about, whether your hypothesis was supported, whether your p-value is lower than 0 0.05, whether your results are novel or not, um, it's not even, doesn't matter much whether the results have impact, which is, has been so important for journals uh, before. Uh, so all of these are not important for you to get published. The only thing that matters is that here in this, in this stage, your idea and your uh, design are, are adequate. <clears throat> so if we look at this uh, cycle with all the problems that we have over here, how is, how is this model, this register report, how does this uh, tackle these, these problems? So if you think about this, there is no publication bias because we publish everything, positive, negative, uh, null findings, findings, doesn't matter what the results are, everything is published, so we can really have an accumulation. So we take out this part over here. Then it eliminates all sorts of p-hacking. There's no reason for you to have selective reporting or changing your hypothesis because you, together with the peer reviewers, work in order to have the best, uh, the best uh, outcome. And then if you're not uh, assessed based on the, uh, on the outcome, then there's no reason for you to mess around with it in order to get promoted or find a job in the job market. So if we do this, we eliminate uh, all these problems over here. And then uh, if we insist in the peer review, before you collected the data, we insist that you have uh, sufficient statistical power, that your uh, samples are uh, good enough in order for you to test whatever your model is. So if you do have moderation, mediation, multi-level or anything else, then really have you, do you have the, 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 the sample for that? Do you have enough participants? Do you have the right design to, for, to be able to test this? So you're taking away this problem over here and then um, even if you do a replication, uh, a lot of the register reports are replications. So you tackle this problem of a replication. Novelty is not a big issue in register reports. And then because register reports are all about uh, open science, then you also tackle uh, data sharing. So the, for the first time, I think in, since we started doing uh, uh, science, we arrived with register reports to a point where all of the issues that we had going around this uh, life cycle, all of them, and disappear, then we have uh, something that, that should work uh, should work well. So it should be reproducible, it should be transparent, and it should be uh, credible. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can get expert reviewer feedback when it's most useful. So it's not useful after you collected data and spent five years working on your thesis, then you submit this to the journals and then the, the uh, reviewer say, but why didn't you do that? Even, even, if I, if, even if I knew about this, it's not really clear whether I could have done this to what extent, but it's definitely not helpful that you're telling me this now after the fact. So many journals say, okay, so go and run this again. And then you spend more time going over this in another round of re review. But if you do the review at the design stage, then you get the reviewer feedback when it's useful. And then they can't come back to you in, in stage two and say, oh, we forgot something. They need to do everything. All the reviewer feedback is a stage one. Now, a lot of PhD students um, and early career researchers have a problem where they send things to the journals. So back in my in my management PhD, uh, you know the top journals that we were pushed to to submit to had a rejection rate of 90, sometimes 95 percent, which is ridiculous. Even in Cortex, you know it's a, a good journal in Euro. 90% of the regular articles are rejected. How many are rejected for registered reports? In the stage one, 10%, 10% rejected. And they're basically rejected because uh, the people didn't understand what register reports are. So it's like technicality. So actually no rejections. And in stage two, nothing is ever rejected in stage two because the only thing that stage two does is to make sure that there's an adherence to stage one. So just think about this. As an early career researcher, you want to increase certainty, decrease uncertainty. So 90% of regular uh, articles compared to 10 to zero of register reports 
Uh, it's re really uh, incredible. We've we've submitted, uh, so my collaborators and I and my students and I uh, submitted, uh, what is it, six, seven? I can't keep track of, of everything, but we've submitted all of our registered reports were accepted uh, on, on the first round, which is incredible because I get so many rejections from my you know, usual, the regular articles, but everything that we submitted as a registered report got through and got the, the in principle acceptance, which is amazing. So you get accepted in the first journal that you submit to, the rejection rates are much lower. Um, and then it also turns out that these are much better cited because people perceive them to be uh, more reliable and less, and less biased. <clears throat> So there's all these questions about, so is this, is this really helping? Uh, so you claim that this is helping. You're saying that this is helping. Is it really helping? So I'm going to show you some brief examples uh, of, of why this is, uh, some evidence that this is working. So for example, money priming, which was published in Science 2006. Uh, there's all sorts of evidence. But if you know something about a meta-analysis, and you look at this plot over here, what you realize very fast <coughs> Even if there is an effect from the 174 public studies, so the Cohen's D of 0 0.35, you can see some indications of, first of all, it's very, very messy, and there's some indications for a publication bias over here. So there's a bunch of things that we would expect here, because everything is supposed to kind of fall under this uh, triangle. So there's a bunch of findings here that have never been uh, published, and all of these are kind of just below 0 0.05. So people were kind of like maybe pushing this a little bit to, to get just over the, the threshold. So this is not a good, this is not representative of the universe as we understand in randomness and so forth. But if, when we do pre-registered effect, then we realize actually things fall into place. But when we look at the effect size, the effect size is close to zero. So at least when it comes to money priming over here, we've been able through register reports, through uh, pre-registration to uh, find what it is that we would expect. Uh, but uh, sadly, the findings are not in support of money priming. Uh, whether the hypotheses were supported or not. So if we look at standard reports, everything is supported. All the, all the first hypotheses are supported, close to 100%. It's ridiculous. But now we have enough registered reports to kind of look at. So how many of the first hypotheses are supported? Yeah, somewhere around 40, 40-something. Uh, 40 this just came out uh, by Anne in 2020. So um, register reports really help you reduce this kind of uh, bias over here. Um, <clears throat> also, we have, this is from the medical sciences, after they introduced the clinical trials, which is a little bit like a register report or pre-registration. So before that, all sorts of people found support for all sorts of medicines, doing all sorts of incredible things. But once we introduced pre-registration, you can see that most of these just turned up to be null. Uh, some of them harm, some of them benefit, but most of them. So if you looked at before pre-registration, you would say, oh, it works. If it doesn't, for the most part, either null or works. But over here, you see, actually, there's no, there's no real benefit over here. In terms of uh, Chris Chambers looking at this, uh, uh, you know, the impact of these things, uh, in terms of citation rates, it's very uh, well cited. Um, there's all sorts of indications that uh, register reports are working as expected. Um, <clears throat> so what's the differences between the pre-registration and the register report? It's this added uh, peer review over the pre-registration uh, plan. So in pre-registration, you're doing this with yourself in your own research. You're not really sure, um, you know, what that, um, you know, if, if this is good or not, you're doing this with your collaborators, but peer review really ensures that the journal with the peer reviewers uh, is going to give you feedback on this. And once you arrive at the conclusion, uh, it's going to give you an in-principle uh, acceptance. So you can't add, uh, you know, pre-registration to your CV, but if you get in-principle acceptance on a register report, you can already add this. So it's a, like a guaranteed publication. There's absolutely no, no reason for you not to include this on your CV. And now people can see you're supportive of open science. You've got a publication. You know what you're doing. Peer reviewers uh, actually went through your design and, and help. So it reduces a lot of a lot of stress. I asked a few of my collaborators that did register reports with me to share a little bit of their experience. So I copy pasted what it is that they wrote. So Krishna Savani from uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I, I went over there last year um, to give a workshop on meta analysis. It's amazing that just from this uh, little workshop that I gave over there for three weeks, 
uh, came out uh, three uh, meta-analysis uh, papers. One we still need to finish up, but two finished and submitted, and both of them were submitted as registered reports, and both of them got in principle acceptance from the Journal of Research in Personality. So it's amazing that these uh, students, you know, they're the lead authors. Um, I don't know how many publications they had. Otherwise, some of them are on the job market. But now because uh, they did a registered report meta-analysis, now they have a publication guaranteed in Journal of Research and Personality. So Krishna is the one who invited me. Uh, this is his students, his lab uh, that worked over there. So this is what he writes. Uh, my collaborators and I worked on a registered report with Gilad, uh, that's me, uh, and received in principle acceptance. So this was his first uh, registered report. So if you look, go look at his CV, he's a, an accomplished researcher some really inspiring work, some of it in judgment, decision-making or choice, um, uh, some, some cultural uh, stuff as well. Uh, and he's an, he's an editor right now in JPSP. I've reviewed stuff for, for him uh, and, for, and for that journal. And the nice thing is that once we did that meta-analysis workshop, so Krishna uh, really seemed to endorse a lot of the open science principle. And I, I love that he wrote this. So this was by far the most rewarding research experience uh, that, that he has had. And just think about, you know, a senior scholar who's been in research for so many years, experiencing registry reports for the first time. So I really like this uh, summary and I really appreciate that he sent this in. And then uh, he said, working on registry report really eliminated all the biases with editorials. Instead of second guessing the editor, uh, we worked together with them. We had a dialogue. And then at the end, we ended up avoiding, you know, wasted efforts. Just imagine that we, in the, you know, uh, Krishna and I would work with the students. We would waste uh, a year and a half on a meta-analysis, and then we would submit this to the journal only to tell us, you know, you didn't test this, or this is not interesting enough, or we don't know if we were, you know, what the value of this is right now. Before we even started, um, we already have an in-principle acceptance, and now it's only a matter of completing this. So I'm very, I'm very grateful about this. So I want to summarize this as a rewarding research experience, even for senior scholars. And then there's clarity. You don't need to second guess. Everything is very, very open and clear uh, in this sort of thing. One of the students working with me, um, which I really appreciate. So when I asked uh, whether he's willing to uh, try register reports with me and go for the open science journals, uh, he, he gladly said yes. So I really like it that he summarized this. There's a lot of text over here, so I'll try and kind of like cut to the point. But I, I like, so I highlighted this, that he helps reduce the uncertainty. Just say, imagine, you know, a first year MPhil student has no uh, experience in, in submitting things to the journal. And this is the first time you want to submit something to the journal. So you don't, you don't have a good understanding of what the journals are looking for, what the peer reviewers are looking for. Register report really helps you to address that. So you decrease all that uncertainty because you know whatever comes back, it's going to be a collaboration between you and the journal, the reviewers, in order to making things happen. Stage one review can help catch things or prevent all sorts of uh, problems. Like if you don't feel that you're competent enough or you don't, you're not sure that you have a full understanding of the methods or the literature, now you have a better uh, chance of, of getting a real feedback that would help you uh, improve. Um, and then finally, all of the, the reviewers that gave us uh, feedback on register report were so positive and constructive. Most of the uh, um, reviewers that I get from the traditional ones are very critical, sometimes negative. If you do replications, they're even hostile. So uh, for me, it's, it's a transformation in, in the way, you know, the attitude of the journals. Uh, and it saves you time. Just imagine, you know, MPhil first year, uh, I don't know uh, how long it took you if you have a publication or, or to get to a publication. Uh, but Bacinio has been able to, to do well in this regard. So that, that's really incredible to be able to finish an MPhil where, with, with publications in, in good journals. So reduce uncertainty, more confidence into catch errors, peace of mind, saves time. I really like this sort of uh, thing. In addition, the reviewers contribute meaningful, uh, meaningful things. The peer review really helps you make the paper stronger. And I think it's nice that uh, Chinyu added this, that it's, uh, I strongly recommend ECRs and research students in their first or second year to try RR. Honestly, going back, if I could do my PhD again, I would ask that everything that I do in my first years, you know, working with this professor, that professor, everything would be a registered report. It would take away so much of the stress and uncertainty. 
So students that want to uh, do research with me, I, I say uh, only, only register reports. So the only thing that I don't do as register reports, we do our own register reports uh, in the courses, are the students that are doing uh, pre-register applications and extensions in my courses, which requires, you know, very tight uh, time. Um, but this semester we're doing register reports, so. Okay, let's, let's have a look uh, at our resources. Um, so I've, I've babbled for about half an hour <laughs> about why you need reg register reports, but hopefully I convinced you that there's value in this and that this is a real uh, paradigm shift in terms of uh, if I would be you, if uh, definitely if you're an early career researcher, I would really put myself, you know, in terms of doing only register reports uh, from now on moving forward. And if you have some issues with your uh, professors or your PIs, and you're not sure how this is going to work because you're doing, I don't know, fMRI or whatever, uh, secondary da data analysis, uh, then contact me. I will have resources and people for you to talk to that could help uh, convince your professors to, to look at this. So I'm going to show you, uh, first of all, uh, one of the questions that you uh, will probably ask is, so what journals are supporting this? So let's say I'm in uh, clinical psychology or educational psychology or the management uh, field. Uh, what kind of journals can I hope to submit to? So by now, registered reports are format by over 250 uh, journals. And you can go on this uh, website over here in the center of open science and have a look at which ones are participating. So you can click on participating journals. So 263 already. So that's really nice. And you have um, from all, all fields, uh, I think by now, almost everything that you uh, want to uh, do, any field will have some uh, journal that's supportive of, of register reports. So I'll just like go very briefly through this and I'll tell you like my experience uh, uh, with all of this. But um, so like for example, you can see already biology and ecology and medicine, uh, BMJ open science is very open for all sorts of, uh, of, of other uh, you know, man, many disciplines kind of like, um, <clears throat> so there's gen generally experimental psychology over here. Uh, I, I submitted uh, cognition and emotion. So the editors over there are very supportive of open science and pre-registrations and replication work. So if you want to do replication, Collabora right now, the editor is Simin Vazir that used to be an SPPS, uh, one of the, I would say leaders or thought, uh, thought leaders in the open science community. So the editorial team in Collabora is very, very supportive of open science. This is the first year I think that they got their impact factor and it's close to two. So that's amazing. Comprehensive results in social psychology. I was very fortunate to be in Maastricht University in my postdoc with uh, Kai Jonas that, that, um, that uh, formed this, uh, this journal is still, is still new, but they only publish register reports. They don't accept anything else. Everything is done with uh, stage one, stage two uh, peer review. <clears throat> um, so what else can I show you over here? Let me think. So a lot of these, uh, you know, evolution, human behavior, uh, physiology, uh, all the frontiers, uh, although I don't really appreciate that journal, <laughs> but it's supported of that. Um, there are some, like if you, I think some of you are from, from management, so there are a few, a few in management, even from our uh, area. So I told you that we publish, so we have two in principle acceptances from Journal of Research and Personality. So it's like this, for example, you can see the editorial and you can see the, the, the guidelines. So if you go and, and you follow um, and read a little bit about that, I submit to judgment and decision making. So that's a, a good journal that's supportive of open science and everything is data sharing. Uh, by default, if you're in management and you're from this region and you publish in Chinese uh, related um, concepts, then management, MOR, Management Organizational Review. Metapsychology is a new journal that's very supportive of registry reports. So really a lot of options now. If you have any other field and you're not sure where to submit this to, PLOS now accepts uh, any, any field whatsoever. And even some of the top journals, so psychological science, for example, if you're doing a replication, um, a lot of the, I think we'll try at least, all the replications that we're doing of psychological science articles, we'll try and submit this to psychological science. Hopefully at the end, uh, one of them will we'll get through. 
So they are a little bit selective in terms of which ones, which replications. But uh, it's amazing that they they're um, that they're accepting this, that they're looking into it. So little by little, we have more and more of this. I think uh, even JPSP, uh, which is a journal of personality in social psychology, is changing it ways, its ways. So now we're going to submit a, a replication registered uh, report uh, to them. So a lot of promising directions for you to take this, whatever, whatever field you're from. And honestly, I really feel like with the whole, uh, Hong Kong Open Science um, principles assessment in three years, five years in Hong Kong and elsewhere, Register reports, uh, the open science journals are going to be the most important for you in your career and not, you know, the, the other more traditional uh, factors. Okay, <clears throat> let me think um, in terms of our resources. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to show, I'll just open another one. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go back to the resources uh, section. And now I want to show you some templates. Um, so let's say that you're, you're committed to register reports. I, like I convinced you, uh, you, want, you want to give this a try. So um, we, in our course, we do register reports for replication. So we developed a lot of tools for you to uh, take and, and adopt. So I'm just going to give you an example. If you go to this section over here, you'll see that there's a replication and extension main manuscript template. So I'm gonna open this. And I also want to show you uh, that Kit, one of the students that is working with me, um, has also done one for uh, register reports for experimental meta-analysis. Uh, Adrian will uh, soon complete a correlational meta-analysis register report. So we'll have a register report for reg uh, replication and extension, experimental meta-analysis, and a correlational meta-analysis, and you should take into consideration that this also includes, uh, you know, data simulation and, and R markdown in order to analyze this sort of things. So let's have a look and see uh, what this looks like. Uh, I'm going to open both of them, so both the um, the manuscript, uh, main manuscript, and the supplementary. And this is the main tool that our students in my courses uh, use. And basically what you can do is you can go open uh, this over here. You can go to file, you can make a duplicate of this and then just like start working on this. Um, all right, so you can see this is collaborative. So actually you can also go in and, and, and include some stuff. So for example, Kit and, and Chini over here are helping me out and including all sorts of things. And this looks like a regular manuscript. Uh, there are all sorts of things about who contributed uh, what. So there's a, a taxonomy over here. But it's, it's uh, so clear and so easy because everything is separated into sections. And then you know that as a registered report, what to submit when. So for example, uh, for the pre-registration, you just need to do the introduction, the methods, uh, the results. Um, and then in the supplementary, you just need to do some of them. So you know for each stage, for stage one, stage two, uh, what needs to be submitted uh, where. And then finally, everything that you need to edit is actually in, in, uh, in yellow. Uh, it looks a little bit messy now, but once you start going through this, uh, why is there so many? Oh, they added all sorts of things. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm very trusting of my students. So I'm going to accept everything that they said, and then I'll, I'll go over this later on. Um, but generally you can see that um, all of these, um, you know, very easy to, to update every, everything. And whenever, whenever there's some stuff that you should go into, we just include this in kind of like these uh, parentheses of how to, what to look into, you know, some instructions over here. So our uh, students should be able to just go, uh, go over this uh, template and just simply uh, put everything into it. Once you have this template, it's much easier to just get things, uh, things going. You can see this, now for stage one, just the uh, methods and results are using randomized uh, data set from, from Qualtrics. So a lot of, a lot of instructions, uh, a lot of instructions over here. We also specify what the design is. So for example, over here, you have like a three condition by two conditions and then you know what the DV is. Um, so just by, just by going over this template, you should arrive at your own manuscript based on whatever your hypothesis is rather, uh, rather um, uh, simple, rather easy. 
Uh, the last part that I wanted to share with you, I see many of you have disappeared already, so that's okay, um, is this part about uh, frequently asked uh, uh, questions. So um, at this stage, I'm gonna I'm, like I'm gonna open the floor to you. If you have any questions, like if you wrote something from before, it disappeared. But this is like a good time for you to ask things. So for the last two and a half hours, I uh, went over a lot of stuff, uh, showed you some of our resources, uh, shared a little bit of our experience. Um, so if you have, if you're still here and you want to talk about something, something that bothers you then uh, this is a good time. If you don't, I'll just keep going through uh, some of what Chris Chambers uh, is you know, telling people about uh, registered reports. So for example, one of the main concerns that people have is that this involves a lot of time. So as, as you've heard the Siemens uh, saying, it's not necessarily so. As you've seen me demonstrate at the beginning, uh, you can do this uh, fairly easy with the register reports templates. You can really get a register report up and running in terms of being ready for peer review uh, rather fast. And people are really worried that this is going to limit their exploration or perhaps emphasize uh, conf conformatory research over exploratory research. Uh, but this is really not, not the case. So the only thing that register reports is meant to do is to separate exploratory and conformatory. So you can explore as much as you want after you've collected data and you want to add something that's terrific, no problem whatsoever. Uh, the only thing is that you need to document this as a deviation from your register reports, and then just make sure that it's uh, termed as uh, exploratory. Now, Chris Chambers did not just stop with the register reports. Right now in Cortex and some other journals, there's also uh, exploration reports. So um, there is room for reports that focus on exploration. The only problem is that when people some, somehow confuse exploratory research with conformatory uh, research. Let's see what, what else is here. Uh, is, is it suitable for me as an early career researcher? So Chris is saying yes. Uh, I think, uh, especially for me, let's say at some point I would hire somebody uh, to join my lab or when I, when I look at my collaborators, when somebody wants to work with me, the first thing that I look at is whether they're supportive of register reports. I, if somebody comes with register reports co compared to traditional Findings. Let's say somebody comes with me uh, to me uh, with a, a psychological science that was not pre-registered, and somebody comes to me um, uh, with a register report from, let's say, comprehensive results in social psychology or meta psychology. I would much rather work with somebody who is supportive of open science and has done register reports rather than, you know, remarkable findings in some of the top journals. I don't, I don't really understand impact factors in, in top journals. I don't know why they're still emphasized. Uh, if I am um, in charge of anything in the, in the department, I would really uh, emphasize this. And, and you think that now what I'm saying is extreme and perhaps definitely deviating from the norm. I feel like in five years, the norms are going to be uh, very different. So you need to prepare for what's happening in five years. If you're a student, you need to prepare for your job market. If you're an early career researcher, you need to prepare for when you're going to be uh, up for tenure. Um, so for all of these, I think in five years, we're going to be assessed on whether we do a solid research that, that's replicable, that's uh, uh, reasonable, um, and has merit. And, and this comes in the form of register reports and open science acceptance rate, just like I told you, about 10% to 0%. It's unbelievable. Uh, another concern that people have is in terms of how long it takes. So you can talk to Chinyu or Krishna or uh, uh, Kevin and Velvet that have done uh, this with me, it went pretty fast. So let's say from uh, initial submission, it took about two, three months for us to get our initial review. It took uh, most of the time, it took us about, I don't know, two, three weeks uh, to revise this and then submit this again. And then, and then it, got, um, it, it got the in-principle acceptance. So what Chris is sharing over here from Cortex is, is quite, it's quite common, two to four months uh, for you to get your in-principle acceptance. Uh, what happens if you need to change something about the study procedures? Like let's say uh, it's, it's uh, in-principle acceptance, but then you realize that there's some problem. Um, then you can, you can go through all sorts of procedures like minor changes or major changes. And then uh, the editorial needs to see how big the deviation is. If it's something that's critical, that's uh, flawed, that changes the entire interpretation of the conclusion, uh, then perhaps we need to go through another round. 
uh, but generally everything could be uh, you know tackled within the, the the second stage by documenting what it is that the deviation was so part of the process is you collect the data you find out things that are different from your expectations uh, we've discovered a few errors you know, during, during this uh, stage where we had to uh, make some adjustments. Everything is okay as long as you're open and transparent about this, as long as you really share everything about the process. It's not about to, uh, you know, finding reasons to reject you. If anything, Registry Reports is more facilitating and accepting and open to uh, discuss uh, issues with, uh, you know, errors or, or need, needs for uh, adjustments. Um, some of my analysis would depend on the results, how to do this uh, sort of thing. You just need to structure things well in the pre-registration to explain if it's dependent on the results. Then if the results are like this, then you do that. Um, so you can, you can pre-register these contingencies uh, as, as much as possible. I've, you know, till now I've never seen, uh, it could be some very extreme cases like in terms of all sorts of modeling or I don't know, people doing all sorts of, uh, things that I don't understand, but in most cases, you should be able to uh, write something for all the analysis that will come up. And then sometimes you have forking path. You have, you know, if it goes this way, then we analyze it that way. If it goes that way, we analyze this differently. But you really want to think about this before you actually uh, collect collect the data. Um, so somebody asked about existing data sets. Uh, you haven't analyzed this yet. So how about uh, register reports in that sense? And then yes, many journals actually offer secondary RRs. Uh, so another thing that I wanted to show you, uh, now I really worry that my computer is going to crash. So uh, I'll try, uh, hopefully I won't lose you. <clears throat> So I want to show you that uh, the Center of Open Science also did uh, this remarkable uh, register reports. Um, so yeah, Hold on. comparison of register reports. So you can get to this from the main from the main page for the register reports. But if you're curious, which journal accepts? which kind of register reports. So for example, we do uh, quite a few meta-analysis register reports. Not all of the journals are supportive of this. Journal of Research and Personality is supportive of this, but if you want to do a replication, some journals are accepting of this or specialize in this. If you want to do a meta-analysis, uh, 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 specialize in this. What you can see over here for, I forgot who asked about the secondary data analysis, is they have column seven and most of them or many of them have the feature of doing a register report for existing data sets. So there is a way to do this, just follow the primer that I showed you before and you'll be able to, uh, to do that well. So this is a very useful um, table and Chris updates this and Brian Osek updates this. So I visit this quite often to keep in track of who, who publishes replications and meta-analysis, which is the two columns that I really care about. Uh, and here's actually it's in my presentation, so you can follow from that. And you can see that uh, big table. Um, what is this about? <clears throat> so if you do replication studies, and we do a lot of replication uh, studies, then this is a really good uh, system, especially if you already conducted the replications and you send this off to uh, review. Sometimes you get the original authors, and and they're not happy, uh, especially if it's a failed replication. We've had some really hostile reactions. Uh, that got me really worried. Uh, but if you're doing a, a registered replication, there's no need for the original authors to be hostile or, or have any doubts about, you know, your motivations or who you are and what you found, because you work together with them in order to address uh, this this sort of thing. So all sorts of things about motivated reasoning, you know, the original authors um, looking at their failed replication and then saying, no, it's because you ran this not in Princeton, but in Harvard. You ran this on, uh, you know, doing 6 p.m. and at 6, uh, 6 a.m. You know, they have all sorts of uh, pushback on this. But if you have registered reports, you just need to like work together with them in order to get to the to the right uh, to the right design. Is it well cited? Yes, they are. Anything else? Uh, how to do power analysis? So if you want, we actually have some good um, uh, tutorials on it this week. So we post everything on the Open Science Framework. So uh, if you want, you can kind of look at our tutorials. We also have 
um, guides on how to do power analysis and how to uh, calculate uh, effect size. So for example, um, our guide over here that's maintained by Chinyu. So you can see over here, if you want to calculate effect sizes, confidence intervals, uh, or do power analysis, we have a really good guide on this. So whatever your design is, you should be able to find uh, the right way to do it here. If not, you can comment on this document and Chinyu, I, the other collaborators will try to help best we can. So you can see if it's a t-test or it's counts and proportions, or if it's a NOVA or F-test, uh, uh, whatever the design, two-way, three-way, uh, mixed, repeated, uh, correlation, regression. So Chinyu has done a remarkable job over here. Uh, very, very uh, nicely, very nicely done with all sorts of uh, pointers uh, and some some code and, and explaining exactly what uh, each each and every effect size is, and then giving you some uh, R code or how to calculate the degrees of freedom. So really nice way of of helping you to do your your power analysis. So whatever your power analysis is. I think getting feedback on the power analysis from peer reviewers in the registry reports uh, before data collection is really important. I'm still learning how to do uh, power analysis. It still I, it baffles me sometimes that, you know, there's so many designs, there's so many ways of, of running these things. There's so many libraries out there and there's so many researchers that have different perspectives. We try to put everything on the, on the guide, but I'm learning new things uh, all, all the time, you know, Conducting a uh, hundred replications uh, is going to help you help you do that. So the more that you do, uh, the more that you work collaboratively, the more you have uh, these kind of uh, uh, guides, and uh, the better you, you, you're going to do in terms of of getting to the right power analysis. Uh, can anybody scoop you? I think if anything, registered reports protects you from that because uh, you've submitted this to the journal. So now, you know, it's, it's official that somebody is going over your design. If somebody else comes with exactly the same design, you can say, but I submitted this to the journal at uh, this, uh, this uh, stage, uh, and then it's, uh, it's mine. If you also, also updated the preprint, then that really means that you have uh, a way to prove that this is yours. Um, is it just single studies? You can do a sequence of experiments for sure. There are all sorts of ways of doing this. So you can look at some uh, um, examples, for example, um, from here, from the Royal Society. A question, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering what the process is like for pre-registering a meta-analysis. Would this be any different? So once again, there's like a difference between a pre-registration and a register report. I'm assuming that you mean a, a pre-registration. Uh, there is a difference uh, between doing, let's say, an experiment or a survey to doing a meta-analysis because a meta-analysis uh, includes different kinds of considerations. So for example, power is important, like how many uh, studies included in a meta-analysis, but let's say uh, you just want to be comprehensive. So you would want to get to all of the published findings on some uh, phenomena. So power is, let's say, less of a consideration. And if you don't have enough power, then you can compensate uh, by doing all sorts of uh, things like uh, bootstrapping and modeling in order to help you get to that. But the thing about the challenge about meta-analysis is uh, rather than, I think the analysis are pretty straightforward. So if you look at the R markdown, the R code that Kit wrote for the registered report uh, template for the meta-analysis, it's pretty straightforward. Like uh, it's, it's usually the same metaphor package, a bunch of other vi visualizations. Um, so pretty straightforward stuff. But the, the important thing is how do you do the search? How do you do the coding? Because meta-analysis uh, take a lot of papers that were designed in different ways. Have you know, one paper has a two by three repeated. The other one has a two by four uh, uh, between uh, subject design. How do you aggregate all of these together? How do you code them together in one coding sheet? So we had to um, spend a lot of time thinking what the optimal coding sheet is like. How do you structure the search patterns, how do you conduct a systematic review of the literature to make sure that you've really found everything. In a meta-analysis, you also, you don't do this alone. You also reach out to the community. So you contact the authors, you put uh, notices on listservs. So all these things are part of your methods. All of these things should be pre-registered. So 
I think more in, in the you know the experimental and the correlation also you have you have very um, you, know, you know you have things that are more about the so is it well designed how to analyze this what is the right analysis for meta analysis the analysis is pretty straightforward and it's it's quite similar in the way that you run this but you really want to pay attention to you know uh, the coding in the search and part of that is let's say what are the right moderators so how do you code these moderators how do you achieve inter-rater reliability so you have different considerations about uh, things when you conduct uh, meta-analysis we've tried our best to tackle this in our template there are also other initiatives that we uh, joined so we just completed last week we joined the center of open science team uh, with uh, Almo uh, and, and others in order to get a template on the open science framework. So I think in a month or so, when you go on the open science and you want to uh, pre-register, you also have a template for uh, meta-analysis. There's also an amazing uh, project called Miro for doing any systematic review, even if you're not doing a, a, quali a quantitative meta-analysis, if you just want to do you know, a review of the literature, uh, a Nero, just look it up. Uh, maybe I can uh, show this. So they have uh, an OSF page, uh, Jade and Marta are, are looking at this. And then you have a bunch of, uh, of uh, really interesting things that they're doing. Uh, so you can follow all the tool and, 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 uh, and the templates. So they really help you think structure uh, what's different about a meta-analysis. And it seems it's not just meta-analysis, uh, systematic reviews uh, require different things, uh, different emphasis. Uh, they should include everything that's you know in a typical study, but there's also a lot more going on because you're dealing with an entire literature with different designs, different people, different uh, challenges. So I hope that that kind of answers uh, answers your question about this. So I think uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we lasted three uh, hours here somehow. Um, I really want to thank you for joining me on this uh, on this journey. Not everything went uh, smoothly, but I really like it that we were able to show you hands on what the uh, open science uh, framework um, uh, looks like and how it works. I'm just going to put this back here again. So uh, this is the workshop that we've done. All the slides are going to be available for you to uh, download uh, everything that I do is up on my website so all the workshops that i give um, all the videos that i record all the projects that i am involved in everything tries to be as open as possible and everything is available for you to learn from so if you need templates if you need examples if you need information uh, i would really recommend that you go over this have a look at the resources and both myself and the students working with me uh, my collaborators, we're very, very uh, excited when we have other people that want to join us and want to do more open science. So if at any stage you feel like you need some direction, you need some help, you're not really sure what to do this, perhaps you feel like you're alone because your professor, your PI, your collaborators are not in the open science mindset and you need some support, uh, we would love to hear from you. We would love to, to help you. Many of the people who are now my collaborators are people who uh, reached out to me, you know, out of nowhere. I'm very active on Twitter. So uh, I met a lot of amazing people on Twitter. Many of my collaborators I, I, did, I did from Twitter. So never feel like uh, anything is a bother. You're not bothering me. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you. Even if I'm very busy, which happens sometimes, let's say during the semester, um, then I'll at least find somebody else that might be able to, to help you until I find a little bit more time but I do try and answer uh, everything. And we also have some uh, Slack, uh, you know, the lab. Uh, so depending on what it is that you will need, the kind of help and support that you'll, that you'll require, we can think of all sorts of other solutions to offer you. So we're trying to do some uh, nice things about open science here in, in HKU. Uh, if you're here in Hong Kong or even in mainland China, not too far away, Macau, uh, and you, you wanna work together, uh, we would like to have an open science uh, center hub here in Hong Kong, so talk to me. Of course, if you're other places in the world and you already have your hubs set up and you want to collaborate with us, uh, we're really looking forward to doing more of that. There's a group in Brazil that I'm working with. There's a group in the Netherlands, uh, in Scandinavia. So 
uh, a lot of exciting collaborations and the open science movement is very much openness, transparency, but it's also about community and helping one another. So do reach out, to, do, do let us know how you're doing uh, and, and hopefully we can move into a more uh, credible, uh, open, reliable uh, science so that our students and the next generations would come into a science that would be much more trustworthy. So keep safe and hopefully see you in another workshop. Thank you.